Recording is on. Oh, Good morning, okay. everybody. It's uh, Sunday, June the 23rd, and this is the Eastern Extinction RT meeting. Um, and so let's kick off. Um, all right. Um, kind of full agenda. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about ufology. ufology. Um, and yeah, this is my least favorite subject, but is does anybody mind? Because, you know, I know there are lots of subjects that people want to do. Um, um, the only thing I was going to suggest is you, you want to just do this uh, spell to bind Donald Trump because it, it might take longer. We just get it out of the way. I, I was thinking that if we do it, um, we could elaborate on it gradually over the weeks. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, I mean it's up to you. I'm I, not insisting. I just, I, I just, I, uh, I just. The only thing was, I thought we should do it to to bind all the one percent because it was very partisan, and it's like, you know, obviously yeah. these guys think that Biden is the good guy, and Trump is the bad guy. And I think it's like they haven't quite got the full picture yet. <laughs> but like they're um, both just two sides. Of the oh side yeah, no, no, no. I, I mean, I agree. Well, do you want to just leave it, and I'll, I'll just. Uh, replace a couple of words in that little text and make it a little bit more general. Because, uh, okay, I lose my cursor here. So, uh, oh, man, this is, uh, we're going to have to apologize to everybody and for this. Bad. Yeah. Sorry, I've lost every, I've lost the video completely. Hang on, that's back. Now what happens? Well, maybe, maybe we should um, get this together later. Yeah, later. maybe maybe do it later on. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So maybe we need a real practice. But anyway, it's pretty ballsy to, you know, to bind Moloch on Moloch's own machines. <laughs> I mean, it's just like that uh, funny little, you know, video about the banksters where he's like, grab your balls, you're going to need them. He gets iron balls out of the back of the trunk. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that one. It was really cool. Okay, well, so, okay, um, then, I don't know, should we start on the woo subject of the year, uh, ufology? Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead with that. Hugh, if okay. I log out, if I log out, will it stop the recording? Or yes, it will. Don't, don't, don't do that. Uh, yeah, uh, well, don't you're going to have to put up to be, well, I'm going to be invisible. For some reason, my cam neither of my cameras are working now at all. Can you see me? Right. I can't see. Yeah, no, I'll just sit, I'll just sit here in the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> what it, whatever's uh, gone wrong, it's completely removed the cameras. It looks like it's still recording. So anyway, we're we're twenty minutes into this, and it's yep. like go ahead then, go um, ahead, stop wasting time. We've, we've done nothing. It's like we've, we've done we're nothing. Really yeah. people off, so we better start. Okay. Um. Yeah. So first of all, let me tell you the reason why. I want to do ufology, and ufology is my least favorite subject. I loathe it. It's somewhere around about the vegan religion, and when it, it's just agony doing this, these discussions. But anyway, um, it came up because I put a bit in the manifesto um, about, I don't know if anybody's read the manifesto yet, but it's, it's this little paragraph that I put in to warn people about that uh, there's liable to be atmospheric um, anomalies and things like that. And they, you know, just to, to ignore them, that I so basically that people are, might get a bit of euphomania. And I tried to palm it off on, you know, geophysical phenomenon, which, which is correct. You know, the Hesselden lights and the Minman lights and that, they are just natural uh, phenomena based on piezoelectricity, basically, in the rocks. Um, so piezo means uh, squeeze from the Greeks for squeeze. And if you if you squeeze a semiconductor like quartz, it's, um, it actually produces electricity. So it makes that, um, that torsional squeezing energy. It, make, it makes electrical energy out of it. And so that happens on a large scale, and it makes interesting lights and ball lightning and all sorts of stuff that um, you only got a sketchy view of what the mechanism is but 
you can produce it in a lab. And so um, it's pretty well established. Uh, but it overlays all the UFO stuff because when there's earthquakes and volcanoes, then you often see lenticular clouds and little and lights and stuff like that. And then, you know, thousands of people have seen in Mexico, they've seen a, a volcano with, um, with these uh, kind of UFOs going, going around it. And then often people see UFOs diving into volcanoes and stuff. And so there's, that is confuses the, the whole UFO scene, but that natural phenomena. So I tried to be a clever dick and I tried to just say, look, tell you guys, like, forget about all this shit. Um, there's going to be a lot of mad crap UFO mania. And I said, just, just ignore it. And then I put a little joke in there saying, you know, and if, if a spaceship comes down and lands, don't get on board because it's a trick. And I thought I could get away with that and give you enough hint that just, this is Machia, all the, uh, the, the UFO stuff. But then it, I saw more and more that like something is brewing. I think that something is brewing. And I thought, I'm not going to get away <laughs> so easily. Um, so I, I've got to, in this thing, I think, tell you my theory of UFOs and UA, UAPs and, you know, undersea objects and stuff, because it's, it's too woo to put in the, man, the manifesto. I mean, the man, manifesto already is woo squared and most people won't read it, but it, it'll definitely tip it over if I warn people against the, what, what I think might be coming. Um, so, yeah, um, now, one of the reasons why I hate it, you'll see if I talk about it, why I hate it, but one of the reasons I hate it is, is I'm not at all sure about anything I'm going to tell you. Um, so it's speculation, and it's my theory. Now, I don't mind telling anybody about the flipping, because if it's wrong, there's no harm done. I mean, in essence, the flipping is just like a memento mori. It's just saying... You know, guys, uh, we haven't got long, which is something you should tell everybody. Everybody needs a memento mori. And all the upshot of it is, is, you know, you should just prepare for your your death and you should, you know, live every day like it's your last, which is just fucking good advice. So there's no downside to telling people about the flipping that I can see. It just shake them out of the stupid delusion that they have infinite life and they can afford to dick around like they are. And so that's fine. But here's the, the, the UFO stuff. Um, it's no one really knows what's going on. And I've got a good theory, but it's completely from me. And it could, if you listen to my theory and you, you respond to it, you take it seriously, I could cost you big time. So in other words, if a spaceship does come and land, I'm telling you, don't fucking get on board. It's a trick. Um, I could cost you dearly because, you know, I don't think if a spaceship's going to come down and land on Earth and take all of us up in, in it. But if it did, and you listen to me and I was wrong, perhaps I'm costing you, you know, you, you, your heaven, your eternal heaven or something. And, and, you know, if you stay here on Earth, maybe, you know, we're obliterated and, uh, Earth's obliterated and everybody that gets taken up to heaven is, you know, on this bloody spaceship. So if, if this all sounds weird to you, it is. But uh, the, the reason I say it is that I've been telling people for 10 years, no, two decades, is like, it, I mean, people like you guys who like a little bit, you know, open-minded <laughs> and, and I've instructed, okay. Um, then I've told them like, if, uh, you know, when the spaceship comes down, don't fucking get aboard. <laughs> now, the reason why I often give that advice is because a lot, a lot of people think it's going to happen. And my, I mean, not some, you know, Greer type kooks, although they do, uh, you know, not just the woo crowd in the UFO thing. I mean, guys in the Pentagon, right? Um, who get funding and, you know, have influence on government and stuff. So, so, my okay first off i'm i'm pretty darn sure that there are no aliens out there that, that, that we're absolutely alone on in this universe the only life is on this planet and so 
Now, people hate that. I mean, I didn't realize, well, how badly people hate that um, idea. And, and quite frequently, I've had conversations and often with groups of people and the whole group of people that are especially science type guys. It's, a, it's incredible that scientists and, and, you know, people that love science and are all, you know, this trust the science, listen to the science and are totally anti-woo. They hate the idea that there's no life in in the rest of the universe and i i say back to them like you keep on telling me trust the fucking science you trust your own fucking science is the science is saying that there's no fucking life out there it's the fermi paradox it, it's a barren fucking universe there's fuck all out there so now uh, this rubs people up really really the wrong way everybody you know, I, mostly um and so um, it's, I think Arthur C. Clarke or somebody said, you know, whether there is life in the rest of the universe or there's no life and we're utterly, utterly alone, either one of those is absolutely astounding. And, and people don't take life seriously enough. This is probably the fluke of a billion, billion, billion times. And, and if you think, oh, come on, life appeared here, okay, it only appeared once. And it's, um, yeah, it's, um, I think it's more of a fluke than people realize. People th think, you know, from Darwin, oh, you just have this warm little puddle and then you have a bit of RNA first or DNA first or whatever that debate. And then they, you know, it all kind of, you just stick it in, you do a Stanley Ure experiment, chuck a bit of lightning, you know, do, do Frankenstein and, and woof, uh, up comes life. And that must happen everywhere. It's just probably a little recipe. But I think if you go and have a look at like molecular motors and particularly if you look at helicase, I mean, helicase is necessary. Okay, first of all, don't think people realize that all life is predicated on DNA. It's just a trick that DNA does, nothing else. I mean, you don't get other forms. And they've looked at other forms. It's can you get a sort of carbon-based life? Could you have silica-based life? It doesn't work. It's physically impossible. So, so basically it's it's a trick that, and also one of the things the hidden assumptions that people miss it's a trick with dna and water so everybody you know has all these fucktarded science videos and they have the dna thing i wish they wouldn't do that thing because they're misleading everybody it's a you know it's a trick with dna molecule and water um and so the structure of water and what's happening with water is fundamental it's not it's, it's far more than just, hey, you know, just, it's, you know, the background. It's not the background. It's intrinsic to, to life. And so if you look at a, um, molecular mo motors and particularly things like helicase, uh, I can easily believe that helicase, if, if you look at the mechanism of helicase, it's like, I can easily believe that's, you know, there are billion stars in our galaxy and the James Webb telescope will look out and see a billion, billion galaxies. And so even, you know, although Carl Sagan probably rolls in his grave at saying it, that we really are, you know, the, a chance of one in a trillion trillion. So it's, it's just, it, it, and, and you can see, I mean, I have no trouble believing if you look at the mechanism of helicase. I mean, helicase, if you don't know it, it takes the DNA molecule. It, it takes a big loop back and backwards transcribes, try, uh, transcribes it. So... It's like, how the fuck did that happen? I mean, you can you either got to be a creator, looking at helicase, you either got to be a creationist or say, nah, if this happened by chance, it's a very, very low odds chance. And I, I don't know how anybody who knows about helicase and then can still talk bullshit about life on other planets. It's just like the chances is fucking abysmally low. Okay, so that's my, my premise now. And I told you it's not popular. Now, people in the government, um, I'm talking US government here, right? Everybody talks about the government as, as like it's a uniform, you know, homogeneous block, completely united, and it couldn't be further from the truth. When World War III breaks out and you have a nuclear war, it's liable to be one side of the Pentagon nuking the other side. It's like, don't, don't assume that this is infectional <laughs> beyond belief. So, okay, so there, there are guys um, and and this is one of the reasons why I'm telling you this is that 
they seem to be getting funding. When you see things like Star Wars and stuff, it's, those are the guys. They, uh, I mean, Space Force, not Star Wars. The Space Force, as far as I can tell, is they're gearing up for interplanetary war based on, and the reason why they, you know, see those videos, I think that Lou Elizardo, Lou Lizardo, <laughs> he's like, uh, you know, oh, he's a whistleblower. He's not a fucking whistleblower. He's a government spokesman. They're breaking the news to you. Now, he's not speaking for the entire government, and he's not speaking for these other guys who say, like, dude, you don't want to tell the public we're about to engage in a fucking interplanetary war. Um, you know, tell them later. You, you, you see, you have these factions that all have different theories on what it is. And so so he's probably not speaking for the, the entire government. He's probably speaking for his uh, sect inside the, uh, inside the establishment. But the... Just as an aside, one, one of the reasons why they all say, well, why doesn't the government share all this information? And it's like, because there's a deep state. There's, you see, it, it goes far more than just the, there's been a cover-up for years and years and years uh, that, that, you know, Congress and uh, presidents and that are not allowed to know this shit. It's like they, they're just too fucking junior to know. And, and so... You know, if they say all this, what comes out is a lot more. It's a, you know, you say, well, if 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 this is true, that if you, even the government doesn't know, it, it reveals the secret government. It reveals the fact that there is a deep state, and it's it's the scientific industrial elite that that Eisenhower was warning about. It's the same guys that, you know, when Kennedy gave that speech about how he was saying, you know, it's very un-American to have secret societies and secret oaths. And like Kennedy couldn't have been more wrong. It, it is absolutely American to have secret societies, secret governments, and they're all right from the beginning. It's secret cults, secret oaths, or <laughs> this guy. You know, so Kennedy was trying to, you know, separate avocado from guacamole. So, but, so but the, the average live tired and stuff and hang on can, i'm sorry can, can i interrupt i, I just i just can, you, can i get can you I to get clarify you. uh i don't know if you can hear me okay can you yeah yeah i can hear you fine okay it's behaving very badly the same but anyway i'll go on so you're saying on the one hand that there's there is uh almost certainly no life anywhere else and and now we're talking about interplanetary war um, so that does that mean that they're going to fake aliens and have a, a fake war with them, or does it mean that they have actually discovered aliens and they've kept it hushed up all this time? Is a, is one of those two? They've, or? they've discovered they've discovered aliens and they they've kept it hushed up all this time. So, okay. but here's the thing. Okay, so my theory on what aliens are and what they're looking at. Yeah, you yeah, hang. On, sorry. It, it, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but if they have, but you just spent 10 minutes telling us that they're not there. C can you just square those two things up? Oh, oh well, okay. They're, they're not coming from outer space. So, so the, there's a group, there are various theories of where they're coming from. So there's one faction that says they're coming from the Pleiades. And so they, uh, I, I trolled them in my video. So basically... Uh, uh, I put in a bit there where I'm saying that, you know, um, these guys came down and, and implying that I come from Sirius the dog star. Um, uh, Dr. Neo von Cortex comes from the Pleiades and he represents the Neo Cortex Foundation. He comes down 200,000 years ago. He knocks out 50 genes or so and they give us our alien cortex. And, um, and also we lose the spines on our penis now it's all legit science by the way <laughs> Two hundred thousand years ago we got about 50 genes knocked out and that basically separates us from a, a chimp um or a bonobo so and and what they looked at what the the genes did and they 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 take the brain the breaks of of your neural development your embryo and uh, embryogenesis so the embryogenesis of your brain and nervous system it has breaks that's why you know a chimp becomes a chimp but if you take those genes out you get us you know basically our head explodes 
and uh, and then consequently just just by the by um, chimps and bonobos have spines on their sp penises spikes and so it, it just those those were taken off too out of those genes so anyway, yeah well I just think how much money guys, they save um, i just thinking that they <laughs> save on expenditure at the, the sex toy shop, don't they? You know, they don't need that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I think they're painful. I think so. I put in the video that was like kind of a a, a mercy to the female species of our species. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, okay, so now um, you know, it, it maybe it happened. Maybe the, the these guys are right, but I don't. I don't think so. I think uh, alien cortex was naturally evolved, and then. Um, but it, it, you know, it's not. The, the guys are not as crazy as you might think, because if you look at Homo naledi and all these places where this happened, this happened where I was born, by the way, but a few <laughs> in caves and stuff, just a few miles away from the hospital where I was born, and and so. If you look at Homo and Lady and that, they had they look like experiments. They have you know big hands and they very they're obviously dexterous, some and probably making tools. And maybe even they have a sense of the afterlife, they're burying their dead. But their head is this they have you know almost micro carefully, they have a little fucking melon-sized head. And so it fucks everybody over. But there's so many hominids, they look like fucking experiments. It looks like somebody's knocking genes out not adding them so much just just knocking out genes and to see there, and there was some guy like, like oh maybe this will work we'll run the experiment yeah there was some guy oh, yeah. on youtube a while ago who had these strange skulls i wish i could remember the details now i don't know if he was getting them from just one place in south america do, do you do you recall anything? Oh, I just can't recall the oh, details. No, no, but he's... They're not. They're not. It's just overwhelming evidence. See, uh, all these guys, you see, they're, they're, there's like all these, these, the folk memory of all these different types of trolls. Mm. Trolls are obviously folk memory of Neanderthals. But, uh, but you know, Dobby the house elf that J.K. Rowling is, is, is an old folk memory of this little elf thing. And it, it's probably, um, you know, uh, Florentis or, or uh, Denisovans or something. But they're all these different <laughs> freaking experiments, and they all we all kind of remember them. There's Native Americans remember um, kind of species, a little warlike hobbit thing <laughs> that lived in the mountains. And they, everybody has these stories, and then eventually they're going to find the fucking bones and pick them up and say, oh, "This is fucking weird." Um, but I know anyway, I'm leading you astray here, but do you, do you want to mention yeah, Eric von Brennigan? Yeah, we go. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I know I'm leading you astray a little bit. Do you want <laughs> Do you want to talk about Eric von Brennigan for a minute, or, or is it not? No, 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 no. Definitely not. Definitely, definitely not. not. No, no, no way. Don't, don't. So, so don't. this is what I mean: is don't go down this road, right? Okay. So, so this is Macchio. If you go down this road, and you you will spend a lifetime. Again, I, there are all these things I tell you on the path, like the Bible. The Bible is just a honey trip. It's just an interesting, shiny object that's constructed like a mirror. I'll tell you how you write your own Bible. You just put all these contradictions in. It's kind of like Shakespeare. But you will, if you go and dive into the Bible and take it seriously and try and figure out what it's trying to say, you, you will waste your entire life and you'll never get onto the main project and the main project is dealing with who wrote the fucking Bible, and that's, you know, here, your own head. So in it's your alien cortex, and it's trying to waylay you. And ufology is also a kind of defense mechanism of alien cortex. It's trying to throw chafe up in the air and say, oh, look at this, look at this. Oh, interesting stuff here, interesting stuff there. And then you'll spend your whole life looking at that stuff, interested, 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 always just getting to the beast. And, you know, and it's like, no, the beast is you. The beast is here. So it's like, it's it's a way of fucking you up. So don't go down uh, Fendonikin and stuff because that's you getting drawn in by the siren. This is the same as King's North and the Bible and stuff. You all these shiny objects will draw you away from the main task, which is to kill the beast. You know, on we're on the path to kill the Gorgon, right? And so on the the Gorgon has all these defense mechanisms built up around the path, and it has you know bliss over here, and it has uh, religion here, and this interesting thing, and all of them. If you get into them. You will, you will 
never get to the destination. You'll, you'll be an old person by the time you meet the Gorgon. <laughs> it's too fucking late. It's trying to get you to die of old age before you deal with it. Okay. So, so, okay. So, um, I got it. So, okay. These, the, so I was talking about the origins and all these different factions and where they think. So there's this one faction and, and I, I'm worried now because it looks like these guys are getting funding. The fact that they do space force and stuff like that is, is an indication that they're kind of winning. It's whoever gets the money is obviously winning. Um, and so they would say, and I think a lot, if any ufologists, oh God, please don't be listening. If any of the ufologists are listening to this, they're going to say, Hugh, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. They, they have, you know, these fast walkers coming from the Pleiades. They've tracked these things coming from the side. Yes, they fucking have. But you don't know what they're tracking. And this is what I'm going to tell you. And this is why it's so fucking dangerous. Is So it's like, okay, first fast walkers in the in the sky and he's tracking these things coming down to earth and stuff okay so this is very very old stuff the the hindus will tell you about skywalkers and native americans this is very very old shamanic stuff so the um i mean how common this currency is is luke skywalker in star wars movies is from the Skywalkers from the Native American Skywalkers and Hindu Skywalkers. So it's like, yeah. fuck, fuck Todd Cameron or whatever, just stole that shit and put it in his movie for a dollar. But it's like, yeah, they, they shamans have been seeing Skywalkers and they're all sorts. There's like, uh, you, you know, you better, better have a stiff drink on hand when you look at Skinwalkers. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, the Skywalkers and these, you know, fast walkers and stuff coming in from space, they're far closer more to skinwalkers. <laughs> and I'm talking paranormal phenomena. And so you say, well, what generates them? So, okay, he, this is the danger. The guys in the Pentagon, they think there's shit out there. It's not out there. It's in their heads. Right? And so uh, it's, it's difficult because if you say, oh, it's all in their heads, then Michael Shermer is your best mate. And you'll say like, oh, okay, there's a nice mundane explanation. Then they're just freaking, you know, they're mental. They're, they're just having illusion. I say, well, yeah, okay, in a way. But it, then it suddenly gets off the charts, woo, and Michael Shermer will go running screaming from the room. Because Michael Shermer doesn't know how powerful our own brain is. And so neither do the guys in the Pentagon. So what they're looking at is a paranormal phenomenon that's created by us, by our own psyche and our own telekinetic uh, abilities, our own telepathic abilities. Is This is coming from the inside out. There's not something out there, out in space, coming down to us. Um, you know, if, so how, how bad does this go? Well, if you, if you carry on looking at the Pleiades and stuff, you will eventually, I mean, you could create a planet there in a civilization just by believing in it and studying it long enough it'll manifest there so you know so unfortunately that's more woo than the, <laughs> the nice explanation that these guys are just going off their rocket but they are they're going off their fucking rocket and and, and we're talking they they have military weapons and nuclear weapons and they're gearing up for a um, as far as I can see, they're gearing up for an interplanetary war with something that comes out of their own heads. And the more they see it, they did it in the fucking Cold War with the Russians. They manufactured a threat out of nothing. And it's like the more they believed in the threat, the more they did it, the more the threat manifested itself. It's, it's a paranormal phenomenon. It's not geopolitics or anything like that. It is something that we're doing. And they... And they getting the United States itself is a kind of an ego rule. So it's this shared delusion. There are enough people involved that you can manifest, you know, solid objects. Okay, so how bad how bad does this go? Well, this is this is what I was told. Okay, just let me finish off the theories from where these things are coming from and the various sects and stuff from these. So there's a bunch of guys, and dare I say this. Uh, okay, I'm going to, um, Hank is one of them. So, uh, these guys believe that the, 
the, these are us in the future. So it's we've got to an advanced state of technology and now we're coming back exactly like in Back to the Future movie where Biff comes back to his former self and slaps him around as <laughs> stopping Biff. And so they think that we're come the our future selves are doing this retro causation coming back in time to us to stop us on the Fermi paradox, basically stop us blowing ourselves up with nuclear weapons. And so they so now this is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. You still in one of the videos I posted, one of these guys is one of these this crowd. And what he says is he, he's the guy that talks about how they these entities, basically these lights come over, uh, say a missile silo and nuclear bunker, and they, you know, power everything down. And so they've seen that. Then the Russians have seen another one where the opposite, they power everything up and get very, very close to launch. All done with woo. Okay. So now there are mundane explanations, right? This could be that America's hacked their, their systems and just just fucking with them. Um, it could be that either side has cyber, you know, has a cyber attack which and gets hold of their nuclear and just wants to show them. But then it doesn't really work as a theory because the guys see ships and lights and shit and above the 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 bases. So it's like that explanation doesn't kind of work. I mean, what's the chance that America went Put, put a, some hyper secret technology right over Russia, uh, Russian base, then hack their, their computer systems. Miraculously, they know how to get the thing up to launch status all the way before just almost to launch, but then they back off and they go, ha ha, we just showed you how clever we are. And then they don't even tell the Russians, hey, ha ha, how clever we are. So it's, it's obviously something else. So those kind of mundane explanations don't work. The, the explanation that works for me is the most woo of all, and that's that they're doing it to themselves. No. The, uh, let me finish on where the other guys think they're coming from. So the, there's a bunch of guys that think that these, um, there's basically, let's say the terrestrialists, the guys that say this is all shit, that we live with these other paranormal entities, we're just not very aware of them. I think Lou uh, Elizardo is one of those. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, sorry about this. Hang on. Geez, sorry about that. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah. So, um, okay. There's some people believe that a faction, I mean, guys in like the Pentagon and stuff, they believe that, uh, and the Navy, of course, um, believes that these guys, you know, it depends which, <laughs> where you hang out. If you hang out at sea, then you come to the conclusion that these things um, live down deep down in the sea. And so they, I don't buy it at all because just the physics and stuff is a bit fucked up. So if these, if these Tic Tac and ships and stuff are coming up and it means that, you know, down in the Mariana Trench or something, there's, there's cities that are all kind of cloaked and, you know, um, and then they have factories where they're manufacturing this shit. And then, and then, you know, there's so much weird shit that's dredged up from the bottom of the sea that, I mean, is washed ashore. But then, I mean, I've never heard of little green men in purple jumpsuits and Nikes being washed up on the shore in all the weird shit that, that just never comes up and you'd see a bits of, you know, spaceship and stuff. I mean, they come on, it must be, it, it can't be that. And now where would they get the energy from? And then where, where did they evolve? And, you know, a really all ancient aliens and stuff. It's like, yeah, it's it all like. Kind of uh, does away with David Icke and his purple jumpsuit as well. In one, one process. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it a kind of a, a way of like, like projecting, you know, the sort of logical rationalist way, you know, of thinking, and then like apophenia or whatever that word is, where they see past. Yeah, so it's like a mixture of those, like projecting the civilized way of life out there, like, oh, they, there has to be more of, you know, our intellect out there. And then they see these patterns and then interpret it, you know, as that same thing, sort of. 
okay, yeah, you're on the right track, but go further. Okay, imagine this. Imagine we're all telepathic or we have telekinetic abilities, but we also have apophenia, and that's that's the problem. Is what these guys are doing is they don't know that they you know have these psychotronic abilities and these telekinetic abilities and 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 so they are studying all this stuff and um, they get a bit of apophenia and make this connect they're trying to get a mundane answer but the more they look at the woo the more they create woo so the the and they never get it that the woo's coming from themselves you see they can't make the leap to the fact that saying you see a lot of guys hearing this, especially guys on the inside that know shit more than I do, would say, like, Hugh doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. We have fucking spacecraft in Roswell. We even have bodies. So do, do I believe they have spacecraft and bodies in Roswell? I've been told, yes, and I absolutely believe it. I have no reason not to believe it. Now, what those guys think, say, okay, so then you admit, you know, fuck all. And stop talking about you, you ufology. You don't know anything. You they say like, no, you don't know. You see, Moloch, damn it. Hugh, can I just when you try so? and talk? But, but please don't interrupt too much because when you try okay. and talk uh, about this stuff, you see, you get. If you try and talk about this stuff, you will get interrupted. You see, it's, it's, it's just, I'll explain it later. The same thing happens when you try and take fucking photographs and shit like this. You will get this shit. You see, it has this kind of quality where I would switch my fucking phone off now, but I can't switch my phone off because I'm using it to do this call. I'm using 4G to do this call. But it's not a coincidence that the phone rings now. You just just believe it. <laughs> you get used to it. Um, okay, so so uh, now how do I know this this shit? And I must tell you how I came in, and then you can see my bias and why I have this theory. So. I, I mean, I have one foot in woo. I've always had one foot in woo and an equal foot in technology. So I'm one of the guys that bridges the gap and can see, you know, I'm not scared of woo and I'm not scared of technology. I, I can speak mundane. I can, I've done countless science projects and spent most of my life doing software and stuff. And so, so it's like, I'm not scared of the technology. I've done everything in the technology from, uh, the electronics all the way up to the software development methodologies. And I've done the same on the Wu side. <laughs> I've done Sri Ramakrishna and the magic stuff and stuff. So I'm, I, I'm completely unbiased between e either one of them, right? I mean, they're equal to me. And then I come up with the shit that, that I've seen. And so this is where, where I get to based on Obviously, it's based on entirely from my history and my experience. And this is, but if you came from, if you walked in my sandals, this is where you'll get to, is that it's a creation of our own minds. Now, I got to this space slowly. Um, you know, the first time I realized about psychotronics and stuff like that was, was when I was in the Air Force. And I think I've mentioned to you before that, that, that um, I noticed in particular things, yeah, uh, instances, especially when it's in extremis, when the, there's very, um, it's very psychically charged, or it, you know, there's a lot on the line. So, in other words, you could say, well, are the, these things scientifically testable? Yes, but you, you know, no ethics or review board is ever going to, um, you know, allow this the kind of experimentation that you you would have to do to set up this as a laboratory experience. In other words, people's lives would really, really have to be at risk. I mean, we're talking where these things happen, they often happen in the military and in space programs and, um, you know, explorers uh, going into new territory and stuff. Because our psyche only gets to that in extremists. And so if you want to talk physiology or something, 
you have to, uh, you know, there's obviously it's, they have the feel if you in these kind of experiences, they have the feel of a DMT trip or an LSD trip. Um, so, you know, I think, that, you know, DMT and LSD, all these neurotransmitters and chemicals in our brain, they are contributing to, to the effect almost definitely. Now, you have to get very close to near death and you can't like fake it or maybe you can but i've never seen it i mean this is from all i've seen is like these things happen in the air force when when their lives on the line and basically the really guys are scared for their fucking lives there's that much tension in the air um by the way when you see all these things like the you know the F-19 Hornets and stuff in the U.S. Navy, like those now famous things they released in, in 2018 of um, of San Diego. Uh, you know, everybody, all the kids in that, they watch it and they, they go like, oh, dude, look at that. Oh, i got a lock on. And everybody's saying, oh, this is cool. We're seeing it. So like, it's not like that when you're there. Okay. When you're there, it's fucking scary, terrifying as fucking shit. You know, I mean, it's shit in your pants, scary. And, and that is is involved. That's not coincidental. You have to get to that shit in your pants. So, so it's like on Apollo 13 and stuff. And all these things where, I mean, astronauts, people don't realize how dangerous this is. The guys are, are on the edge. You know, they're almost having a near-death experience the moment they fucking go for launch. And so the... You shouldn't be surprised if astronauts and guys on the you know the moon and stuff. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't know that Apollo 11, that Buzz Aldrin and um, and Armstrong they only survived because Aldrin had a had a, a metal pen that he wasn't part of the the kit or anything. He just happened to have his own personal metal pen, and they they wouldn't be alive. Um, they wouldn't have got got back from the moon uh, because they blew a fuse in in the in the lunar module and they didn't have a replacement and so they were stuck there and then uh um aldrin said i've got a i've got a pen and maybe it'll all fit and he just luckily it was metal and it fit exactly in the slot where the fuse was supposed to go and he held the pen in there while neil armstrong blasted back from the moon so in those kind of circumstances where you just fucking, oh man, blue in the face um, tension, uh, this is where all these things manifest, right? So that's why you don't see them every day and stuff like that. So, so yeah, so in the Air Force, then I, I, I noticed in these things that often the radios would, would go up. And I got to the, the question, I mean, this kind of wartime army and stuff, and you get enough experiences where you start to notice a pattern. And so I noticed like, why when I, you get this particular feeling, this particular kind of place where <laughs> you get to almost like seeing red and you can I know the feeling so well, you get a metallic taste in your mouth and stuff. And then the radios go out. And so I cautiously asked, you know, other people and stuff. And I said, did you th think that we, it was our psyche or something actually, knocked out the radios and everybody kind of agreed and so I, I cautiously talked to everybody pilots and stuff and nobody wants to talk about this because i mean i knew at that stage and like when i was 17 or so, i knew enough for uh, psychiatry and stuff to say that that's magical thinking if you think your thoughts affect radios that's magical thinking that they, they will instantly class you as uh, schizophrenic and they will lock you up I mean, I'm telling you, black blanket. If you if you go to aerospace medicine guy and say like, I think you know, or pilot or something like that, and you say, I think, um, oh fuck it. So if if you say, um, go go to any quack or anything like that and say, you know. Um, I think uh, my thoughts are affecting the radio. That's it. You'll be taken off flight duty. You will end your career. You will be put in a padded cell. That's what's, you know, it's not going to work out well for you. 
my if you talk to pilots and that they say yeah they know it. They're people who like been in battle situations they know that that you know people's thoughts and stuff can affect um, electronics and machinery and stuff. So so you know going down that path I won't go into all the stuff but I experimented and it's you know absolutely proved to myself that you can control electronics you know with your thoughts so i wouldn't share <laughs> i never share uh I, it's a big deal for me to record this right because anybody any psychiatrist looking at this will say okay he's he's nuts um and show you in the dsm like these are symptoms one of them is magical thinking and so Hugh, uh, yeah can i i just want to um because we talked about this uh, I mentioned something to you in a meeting quite some time ago and uh, when you mentioned the Fermi paradox and uh, I think I made a comment about, well, we're, we're holding the telescope around the wrong way. Um, that, that I was looking at it from more a, a sort of traditional spiritual point of view that we've become very separative thinking that we're separate individual things in the world and therefore by extension in the universe as well, instead of being an intimate part of everything. Um, and uh, and so just, just to put it simply, you know, when we look out onto the night sky, we think we're looking at something else, but we're not. We're just seeing the parts of ourselves that we don't recognise are a part of ourselves. So, so we say, oh, that's out there, but it's not out there. There's just, there's nothing out there. There's, there's only just us. There's, there's only one, one capital O one, I guess you could say, to put it that way. Um, yeah, and it seems and, that the. Oh, sorry, Gary, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I wasn't going to say that much more. I, I was just going to say that, like, you know, it, so what we, what we're doing is, is a little bit like a dog that starts. Uh, biting its own tail, that that e until it gets a mouthful of the fucking tail and hurts itself, it's not going to wake up to the fact that the tail is part of it. Um, you know, and I'm wondering whether we're in that situation where it's what it comes that's down exactly. to. That, that's it exactly. But but imagine that dog. You see, it's it's told in the the Ouroboros, right? The Ouroboros is trying to tell you that. Mm. And, but you see, imagine this now on. The, you know, this is not, um, you know, hippies around a fucking fire sharing sharing a joint and discussing their philosophy of life. This is serious shit. We're talking Pentagon and nuclear missile. So they, imagine these guys, they, they, they are looking <clears throat> out. They don't know what they're looking at and they don't know they're creating it. And they're about to fuck, you know, the dog is about to bite his tail. And we're talking, that's a metaphor for us going to nuclear war with our own mm. minds. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, I was, serious. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was I, just trying I, to bring I, it down I, to that more. Sorry, DB, go on, get it out. Yeah, yeah. I, was about to, I was about to say, so it seems that these, uh, the UFO people, whoever they are in the government, it's like its own little egregore. It's like a cult, sort of. It's its own little belief system nested in all these other you know, cults in the system and it's, and they're doing the neurosis. You talked about the Theseus neurosis and you're in that video where they're chasing their own, you know, chasing their own mind. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. So, you know, but how deep does this rabbit hole go? You're right. It's an egregore. It's more than one egregore. Cause I'm, I'm telling you, there are all these factions that have different beliefs and, and they, they all, you know, completely religious beliefs, uh, religious commitments to each one of these point of views that it's us in the future doing retro causality or it's, guys, you can imagine they're all thinking in extremists again, um, loads of DMT every time they talk about it is the, you know, these guys are absolutely certain they, you fucking idiots, stop talking about it's us from the future. We're tracking these fucks. They come from the Pleiades. They, it's, they're gearing up. There are more and more of these fuckers. We know that shit's about to hit the fan. This is all coming to head. So stop your shit. We need to fucking get fucking nuclearized. We're about to go into a planet interplanetary battle. And you know, they think it that strongly. And so and all of that feeds energy into it and, and that eventually solidifies as, as a material manifestation. Yeah, but, but look, it's it's not it's not homogeneous, right? There's there's also an equal faction that 
that are all, you know, kind of hippie. And then that guy who was talking about the missiles going up and up. You see, I've heard that one too. What I've been told is this, is the, I've been told something which really gets, gets my flesh tingling. And that's that the, the guys say, no, you never have to worry about a nuclear war. And they say, I say, why? And they say, because they're guardrails. He says, I've been told, you see, most people agree that, uh, say in the Pentagon, that, that we're an experiment of these guys, an old, old experiment of these guys. And it's, it's a Petri dish. They were, you know, we're, we're the organisms that they creating and we're a big part of the experiment. So it's kind of like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that they made the Earth as a giant computer. And, you know, that, that's where, you know, Douglas Adams was talking about exactly this, this, uh, this viewpoint. And so, but look how fucking dangerous it is, because that guy, he's saying, you know, what they're doing by shutting down the nuclear missiles in America and then, you know, ramping them up, they, they're saying to us is like, you know, these things are dangerous, you know, get rid of them. These things are going to, you know, these are guys from the future, they wouldn't, cut, you know, to ensure that we don't get on a different timeline and uh, annihilate ourselves, they have to come back and do this, you know, kind of uh, episode of Doctor Who where he comes back to give himself the codes. And so they come back out of the future to give us the codes to get through the Fermi par paradox so that they can save their future selves. Get it? So anyway. Hugh, the, the, do, that, yeah. do you, do, do you on, personally? On one second, one second. Okay. That was one second, one second. So those guys, they, they are thinking we have to get rid of all the nuclear missiles. They're telling us, the guy said on the tape, it's like, the guy said, you know, they're fucking with the mu nuclear things to tell us, you know, don't do this nuclear thing. And so now the other guys who say, yeah, sure, they're fucking doing that. The guys are about to invade us from the Pleiades. We know they're scared of nuclear weapons. Everybody agrees nuclear weapons are a big deal with these things. And so, so what these guys are saying is, like, if we disarm the nuclear weapons, that's what they want. They, they're fucking with us because they're hoping you will think they come in peace as soon as we get rid of the nuclear weapons. That's it. You're fucking invaded. And we've got no, no defense. And so they are on the path of we've got to nuclearize. We've got to get this technology going so that we can fight this interplanetary battle. And so you see how fucked up this is. This is a fucking zoo. <laughs> okay, but go ahead, Gary. Uh, what I was just going to ask, give mention of timelines here. And, I, I, you know, and what you said earlier about you bridge a wide, a wide spectrum of, of experience, you know, from the woo over to the other. But I mean, have you, do you ever personally feel as though timelines are switching just during a day or in your own life? Do you, do you, have you felt that or noticed that to any extent that just sometimes you'll look up and think, hang on, there's been a subtle something has happened, you know, that this is not quite the same universe it was 10 seconds ago. It's just been, as though somebody is oh, stuffing yeah. around with, you know, because, you know, it's not hard to imagine that you've got infinite timelines stacked up adjacent to each other and the difference between adjacent ones can be quite small, but just enough to avert something no, or just no, enough no, to no. enable something. All of this is bullshit. No, no. According yeah, all to right. me, all of this is utter bullshit. The retro causality timelines back to the, it's it's bullshit squared. It's just and the so you've got to hang on to your reason a little bit in this, and this is one of the cases where you have to hang on to your reason, because it it makes no sense in the sense that you know that Doctor Who episode where he comes back in time to give himself the codes, and so then well where did he get the codes from? From himself, future self. Where did this future self get, get the codes from? Well, you're stuck now. Because there's a don't you escape that if you've gone to another timeline? Don't you? Do you escape that by jumping to another no, but timeline? That's that's Everett's bullshit. It's like, how do you get a different timeline? It's, it's well, it's, I don't know. Time, it seems it's, it's a it's a um, fucked up idea of time. So time is not a, a, a line or a river and stuff. It's it's bullshit. That's what your alien cortex is telling you. There's only one time, and that's Kairos. It's experiential time. And yeah, you can't I was... split experiences that way. Everett was a fucking idiot. Mm. Everett came up mm. with the worst 
theory that anybody ever has come out. It's an offense against Occam's razor like this. No, never been a worse one. Anybody that believes in Everett's many worlds theory or different timelines is, is just a stupid cunt. Just just get out the fucking room. You're just too stupid to talk to. Yeah, I remember, so they, they, I remember seeing that stuff. And uh, my first thought was like, how does this impact conservation of matter and energy? <laughs> That's it. I was. That's exactly what I was about to say. Is like Everett to 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 account for for basically one quantum fluctuation creates an entire new universe. You say, look, you stupid asshole. Where do you get the energy, the matter, and all that stuff? Uh, you got it out of nothing. You're, you're talking shit, man. Just absolute shit. It's like I don't even go there anyway. That, it's the stupidest thing known to man. It's it's it. I would put that as you know a few things for definite sure, and one of them is. That is not right. This is not us coming from the future. I mean, uh, otherwise, just think about it. You could you do the other thing. What was that other movie where they go with a time machine, they leave a bit of gold, they come back, and every time they make a little loop in time, they got extra gold. Where's that gold coming from? Man, that's shit. this is bullshit. So it's like, uh, anyway, so it doesn't work like that way. Information doesn't yeah, but work wait, you have to and Conservation of energy don't work. It's, it's bullshit. Okay. Where does but you have to go back to where let's, does? Let's not it, even do it. Let's not even do it. Oh, all right, okay, it's, it's, okay. It's, it's, we better leave that. Okay, just take my word for it. It's utter, utter fucking crap. So, okay, so then, um, and and don't uh, if anybody hears this and wants to engage on that, I'm not going to engage with you because you're just too fucking stupid to waste time on. Because you're doing the macho, you're doing the. Oh, but uh, Hugh, let me drag you down into the mud with me. It's like I'm not going into the mud with you. It's like I've I've done this. I've done. I I'm not going to share with you what I've done, but I've, I've done optics and superluminal tunneling and stuff, and it's all horseshit. So it's a, okay. So so anyway, you can't send messages to the future. So, superluminal tun tunneling and stuff. I'll explain to you what it is, but it's not what you think, and it isn't fucking Back to the Future. <laughs> okay, for one thing, if these guys. So Stephen Hawking was a fucking idiot. He he thought this, and he said, well, you know if there were people coming back from the future, why don't we see them or something like that? And then other people said, well, we do, they're, they're fucking aliens. But you see, if if that were, were true, you know, one of the explanations, which I'm surprised Hawkins didn't figure it out as a physicist, was that, you know, it could be that going back into the past requires a lot of energy and they just don't have the energy to go that far back so that they could, you know, basically come five years back. But we haven't got to the point where they, we invent time machines, so we can't really come back in any serious, hello, you know, Mr. President, take me to your leader kind of shit, because the, you know, they don't have enough en energy to manifest the entire, say, spaceship or something. Maybe they just have enough energy to get a signal back or a bit of light or a thought message or something, you know. So, but anyway, don't go there. This, it doesn't work uh, out, and it's it, it's all... Yeah, I don't think it's what's going on. So let's let's just save ourselves a bit of time because this is what time thing. They're trying to run the clock out on you so you don't get to the truth. So, okay. And who's trying to run the clock? Our own brain, our own psyche, the alien cortex, the demon inside us is trying to run the clock out. on. So we never actually see that it's pulling this trick. Okay, so anyway. Okay. Um, uh, so, okay. So now how deep, uh, does this go? Um, well, it's it goes uh, it goes very deep, um, and by that I mean is is like we we have the ability to we're talking like golems and manufacturing you know physical entities. So I'm not surprised that I've never seen a fucking spaceship in Roswell, but I'm not surprised that they do have uh, spaceships. And I, this is what I was told. Okay, so now I'm going to have to reveal a bit about myself and dox myself a little more, which I don't like doing, but anyway, I've got it. So, um, okay, so I told you about the microwave ovens and microwave melt and glass and stuff and that's where i came from and did experiments so to do that i uh i assembled a team of like the, the best glass guys in the world and the best ceramics and materials 
guys and um, some of the best microwave guys. So the microwave guys were, I can't tell you the names, but just, but there's two guys that were called Dr. John, let's say, and, and Dr. Richard. Dr. Richard was from Canada. He did some of the serious um, measurements and stuff in, in Canada that generated data. It was so interesting um, that Dr. John, I don't know if he's still alive. This was in around 2005 or so. And then, but Dr. John was like in his 80s. Uh, and yeah, but really spry. I mean, really fit both of them. They were really old guys, but they came out of the stuff I was doing was so exciting. They came out of retirement um, to do it. So, and, and it, it generated so many different shiny objects and woo things that you wanted to get into that, you know, everybody was like, Oh, I want to go take this direction. <laughs> it's so exciting and stuff. But um, so I told you it was a, a glass furnace, but I can imagine I'll tell you a bit about it. So uh, it's uh, technically what's called a top fed glass furnace. So you have to imagine what it is is a, a resonance chamber. So it's sort of imagine your microwave oven, but circular. And the, the cavity is, is exactly a multiple of the wavelength you're using. So you're using either nine gigahertz, which is like industrial mag magnetrons or 2.45 gigahertz, which is the, what your, your cooking microwave oven uses, right? So I, I think it's 14.25 uh, centimeters, I think is the wavelength, if I remember correctly. And then was, so as long as you do use 2.45 gigahertz, you use uh, a, a barrel, let's say, of exactly uh, across dimensions of, of, of that. What you get is a, you know what? All I'm always about feedback and stuff like that. So what if you if you get a waveguide, you duct a, from multiple things so that they cancel each other out and stuff. You get a lot of electromagnetic energy in the barrel, but and what is happening is uh, you get the waves. They're coming from each side into the middle, focused into the middle. In the middle, then they they. Um, cross over and then go back to the sides and then so it, you tune it and it becomes a, a, a resonant cavity. So now this is no, this is all stuff is known stuff and the, the, my unique contribution to it was because I had this realization that most people think and radar experts and stuff they think that glass is you know in uh, you know completely penetrable by, by radar. So it's basically transparent to radio waves. And so, you know, they just know that in one compartment in their head and stuff. And so what I, my contribution was to say, well, no, hang on. It's dependent on temperature. It's uh, the dielectric of glass changes very slowly with temperature, but when you start getting it really hot, you know, like cherry red, it's about 800 degrees Celsius. The, uh, its dielectric properties go off the fucking chart. They go asymptotic. So radar absorption is all based on the dielectric of the material. So it's like saying, like, you know, if you heat glass up a little bit, um, it'll reach thermal runaway. And the more it uh, the more it runs away, and the more heat it absorbs, the more it becomes uh, dielectric. And the more energy it absorbs, and so you can see where this is going, right? <laughs> um, of course, people start asking, well, how high a temperature can you take it out, up to? And it's really based on the sun, ceramic materials, that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's a material science project because, you see, all the, the electromagnetic energy has been focused in the middle of the, the furnace, the barrel. Um, and they all go through the insulating materials completely unimpeded. Then they get to the hot part, and then they're in the thermal runaway. So it's how, how you know all the energy you put in goes into heat very very efficiently and goes off the fucking charts. Well, obviously you can see where they're going to take it. The first thing they say: Can you take this up to millions of degrees? You say, Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and uh, they say then. Um, you know, you see where they're going with it. They want a fusion. <laughs> Here's the problem. 
fusion engines don't work. The, if you hear anything about it, you know, the, you, you hear all these things all the time. Oh, these guys made a breakthrough. They have a net energy transmission. And now they, for a few seconds or something, they run energy positive on this fusion thing. It's all bullshit. Because the physics doesn't allow it. The, the material science beats you. Because as soon as you take the temperature up high enough, the, it starts spitting out neutrons, and the neutrons go, th they neutral, <laughs> they go through everything just like the electromagnetism. So, so the neutrons will destroy any material you've got. So they, well, you wind up in this chasing, the material scientists chase the materials, and these <laughs> everybody's chasing their own ass in this kind of Ouroboros. But the, you, you can see a kind of a limit where, you, you know, they don't they believe there's some magic material out there that you can contain the neutrons and stuff in it it's like but they're really getting to this point where you can see that it's not by accident that there are no materials that will withstand the neutrons as you're looking at it's telling you something it's telling you like a theory of everything of the universe right so it's there's a reason why there are no materials like that because you know it fundamentally why neutrons are like they are and stuff. So, so you'll never get a fusion reactor that's that because it'll it'll break its walls, right? You'll get to, so anyway, I just uh, do that. So, but anyway, that that was a high interest area. But the other one was this, and this is why we get back to <laughs> ufology. The um, uh, the great thing about this is is uh, it, it, once you initiate the glass melt and um, you just have to get this. We realized later you just have to get it. When 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 I started, we start. I realized that you take a radar absorbing material like hematite, you know, basically iron, just powdered iron, right? Is it powdered iron and stuff? If you you know, it's used on these stealth fighters and all of that. They use it with epoxy. I'm telling you stuff which might be secret. I don't think it's so secret anymore. But anyway, the, the, those things are. You know, any ferrous material be as a part would be very radar absorbent. Um, as it happens, it's not much good for stealth fighters and that because it makes a big radar hole. You have a big radar gap, and then um, you know that that hole is is a is a bigger signature as the fucking radar returns. So you, you don't really get ahead with your stealth fighters and stuff. But anyway, that's an aside. We started off with hematite using that as an initiator, it absorbed enough microwaves to heat up, and then uh, it would reach a runaway and then melt all the glass around it. It's a top-fed furnace. You put all the materials on the top, and then you basically have a nice stream of glass coming out at the bottom. And then you, you just balance the energy that you're putting in with the rate that um, the glass is coming out, and then you stabilize it, and you've got this stream of glass, which essentially you can switch on and off. We found out after a while you didn't need the hematite to initiate. You just basically get a blowtorch and you just heat up a bit of the the raw material, and uh, it's you know as soon as you got some a little spot of molten glass that was enough, and you could as long as you balance the energy and stop the energy going back into the magnetron and stuff. It would be it would you could reach runaway just from initiating from a hot spot with a with a blowtorch, and so that saved a lot of time and then we find basically you, you can switch it on it's basically glass on tap it's molten glass on tap now these guys went went nuts because you know clear glass is is not, it, very difficult to make with, with the current conventional things because it's done in a tank furnace you either use gas which is dirty you know or otherwise you have these cathodes and anodes that are under the melt is very corrosive and stuff and you have to have molybdenum walls and the, the molten glass is, is very very corrosive and so it's the, the you get all these particulates into the thing it's unavoidable um, it, the glass uh, doesn't really if you use induction heating um, the clear glasses doesn't really conduct like you like these guys say and stuff so um, you have to put in things like iron, and then the glass is contaminated green. And anyway, you, so it's very so. What what so? I'm, what I'm telling you basically is that this microwave furnace was basically the purest quality glass you could possibly imagine, um, done, um, you know, just just on tap. <laughs> this is right. Now, why is this uh, all relevant? 
um, because if you take a thin stream of, of glass like that, it's, it makes one of the things you looked at is uh, fiber optics. So fiber optics are normally made with a platinum, um, you know, just basically a platinum nozzle and you melt glass and you string it out of the platinum nozzle and in a thin fiber. Glass really, really wants to form a thin, thin fiber. And so you just draw that up, put it on a spool and you can spool up as much as you like. Um, and then the reason why we're having this phone call, by the way, is it's over fiber optics. The, the, the bits of technology that made the modern world is especially the transistor, the laser diode and the LED um, and fiber optics, those, those three. I mean, that's the modern world. If you're talking about Moloch and the beast and stuff, <laughs> those, those inventions. Now, getting back to Wu and the ufology, I was told <laughs> that, well, I, immediately uh, we, when you think, okay, the America's got these spaceships and they probably have anti-gravity and stuff, so does that mean America's flying anti-gravity machines around? And, or, you know, why wouldn't they if they got these things out of the 50s? And why wouldn't they? And I'll tell you why. Is... Um, uh, no, America doesn't have anti-gravity machines. They're not flying, you know, they haven't reverse engineered all this alien technology, even though they have, as far as I know, uh, various ships, uh, spaceships that crashed um, in places, probably not in, in Roswell. They're more secret places than Roswell, by the way. Um, but the, um, I'll give you an example. The guys go into Roswell, I believe there's a commuter flight that goes out. It's like a passenger jet with 300 people or so on, or maybe more than one flight. I think the windows are all blocked up. So you have to imagine that these guys go to Roswell, they get in a plane, uh, you know, they commute for about 30, sec 30 minute flight, and they don't know where they are. They get out in the hangar, <laughs> they, go, they go underground, spend all day underground, and then they come back in the, and they don't know. That's how secret these things are. But the in one of those sites, they probably do have a spaceship. I think that spaceship was manifested by their own minds. It's not coming from outer space. So, okay, and I'll, I'll go into why why I think that. So, so if if they have this, then everybody speculates. Well, and they they've they know everybody knows they've been trying to reverse engineer these things forever um, since the fifties. And so, you know, say well, what inventions? Have they got, you know, you see this uh, Lou Lozado guy, he keeps on talking about materials <clears throat> and saying, you know, he gives loads of breadcrumbs and saying that it's unfair that you know, some, one company was given, given access to these materials and they become super rich and then other companies lose out and, and they're not even allowed to say or sue <laughs> because it's a secret. But anyway, he's hinting all these things and I'm thinking, what are these fucking materials and shit and stuff? And I, I, uh, you know, I don't know if there are any la laminates of bismuth. I've never seen such a thing. This is, but this is what my where I come into this and what I know is, I okay. Let's go through a few of these things that, like ufologists say, that you occasionally you hear, oh, the transistor was was a an invention that they reverse engineered from spaceships. Nah, it's not. You know, it's not. It's, it's a. The transistor is shockly in all of those guys. It's just a development of the tube. And by the way, the magnetron is too, a vacuum tube. I can't remember what English people call it, a valve. A valve, yeah. So English people call it a valve. But anyway, it's uh, a magnetron is just a valve where you've got a, a cross field. So you get a, a magnet, strong magnets on either side. And instead of, you know, you have a cathode, think of basically a light bulb element in a light bulb, something red hot. Well, well if you do, if you heat up a, a, a you know, an anode with a, so that it's, um, uh, or cathode rather, and then it starts spitting out, um, you know, charged particles. And then you, you just have somewhere near it, you, you, you have um, an anode and then they all go to the anode and makes a current. Well, you just stick something in between that, like imagine a, Venetian blind or something, and then you put a tiny current on the Venetian blind, and in fact, it, it shuts the blind. So you can open and shut the blind with a tiny current and then interrupt the flow from the cathode to the anode. That's what a valve is. 
A magnetron just takes those particles, makes them go round and round in a circle. If you get the cavity just right and make little like whistles, basically holes for the, does the electronic version of a whistle and the frequency whistles just, just like a flute or something like that. The particles going round and round, you can imagine them going round like a, like um, ionic wind or something, and uh, you know what uh, what frequency they emit is is the resonant frequency of that flute effect. So anyway, brilliant stuff. Anyway, so so anyway, the the magnetron is fucking awesome. I could tell you lots about the magnetron, but anyway, the the magnetrons and stuff were and Dr. John and Dr. Richardson stuff. They went back all the way to. Percy Spencer. They spent. They worked with Percy Spencer, um, uh, uh, you know, on on the first ray dozen, the first microwave ovens. The the microwave oven was invented by Percy Spencer. He's a fascinating character because he's was self-taught, um, but he was mad about microwaves and, and uh, he would have done a lot more with microwaves. He he used to heat his lab and stuff with microwaves, <laughs> which is. Uh, freaks people out but the heating you can heat a room very easily because you only need to heat just the surface of your skin and it, you know Percy would do that he um, he would you know very very efficiently heat a room um, with terribly little bit nobody wants wants to do that and the reason why we don't have microwave heaters for rooms and stuff is because not because it's dangerous it's because the public perceives it to be dangerous because it just so happened that this is, um, you know, electromagnetic radiation. And it just so happened that the public learned in the 50s about ionic radiation and they never got the two. They thought, you know, radiation, radiation. And so everybody still thinks a microwave oven is terribly dangerous. It, it might cook your eyeballs like an egg or something. But in general, it's not. It's called electrophobia. And Dr. John spent many, was in many, many court cases as an expert witness, but I think to this day, there've been very few studies that have said that electromagnetism is causing cancer or something. They're, they're occasional ones, but they're, they're always difficult to, to nail down. So he he was an expert witness always to say that, you know, 5G, all these things are not dangerous um, and show all the evidence and stuff. But anyway, um, uh, Percy Spencer invented the microwave oven because he had a Snickers bar in his pocket <laughs> and while he was working with radar and it melted and he suddenly thought, hey, this is fucking awesome. He, he was that kind of guy. And so he, he stuck it deliberately in a radar. And the, the very first um, the very first microwave oven was called the radar range because it was radar cooks food. And so, you know, they tried popcorn and <laughs> it worked like a dream. Um, and so, yeah, the the microwave oven is is often in surveys um, said to be the, the most popular invention of, you know, of, in, of the industrial, <laughs> industrial revolution. But anyway, uh, I, I'm telling you the story of this and, and Percy and these background and stuff, because you must, there's another, the background to the magnetron. So the magnetron is very, very important. Most people know that uh, the computer won the war. So they all know about Alan Turing and the bomb and, you know, decipher the Enigma machine and all the good. It wasn't really so much Turing. It was a guy called Flowers and uh, this thing called Colossus, who was the first computer, the first major computer with lots and lots of valves and programmable and stuff. So like the forerunner to von Neumann architects and so there was Flowers and stuff. So everybody knows about that and the computer. They don't know so much that there were two inventions that won the war. And then the other one was the magnetron because it's, um, it made the radar practical and, and lightweight in aircraft. When, when the Americans came into the war, they came in completely unprepared. They were not, they were, they would have been fucking wiped out if they, if Britain hadn't have shared all the technology uh, in this technology transfer. One of the technologies they transferred was was the magnetron, and that was so important that historians have said that um, this was the most valuable cargo that ever went to sea uh, when it came across the shores of America. And that's no exaggeration. Without radar, um, basically, Britain and America would have lost the war. So um, uh, now, the magnetron was invented 
um, in, in its workable state um, by uh, these guys called Randall and Boot. And um, that is a great story in itself, but it was transferred uh, to America in this exchange uh, called the Lizard, Tizard, Tizard uh, Exchange. It, it was part of Lend-Lease that Britain gave technology to America in exchange for food. <laughs> um, and so the Magnetron was taken over with the, the, the Tizard group. I think Tizard himself um, actually brought it. And here's the important story was that um, this is the most, probably the most secret thing in the war. Um, and it, he took um, this magnetron that, that Randall and Boot had made in a, in a briefcase, just in a fucking briefcase. And why, you know, he didn't handcuff it to himself or anything, so he didn't draw attention. And while he's standing, I think, on Waterloo Station, uh, they were staying, waiting for the train that's going to take them to Southampton and across the Atlantic to America. They, you know, they have this ultra, ultra secret bit of technology in the briefcase, and the briefcase was stolen. <laughs> and, of course, they went fucking nuts, because basically the whole war <laughs> is at stake um, while they're looking for this briefcase. The, to cut a long short story short, um, they, there was big pandemonium. I guess they shut down the Waterloo station and eventually they found that it was just, just an honest mistake and there was a porter who had just picked it up. So um, they recovered it, got on the train and went. I think they should look closer at that porter because if they did, I think they'd probably find that he had like almond eyes and <laughs> gray skin and <laughs> not much of a nose. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because when this is what I was told, when they got to America, to those guys, so they, they, the America started putting these things, testing them in aircraft as radar. Um, and they got the fright of their life because they found that like radar was painting these things and they were all these things that were close. <laughs> what radar apparently did, as I was told, was it uncloaked them. So they found all these fucking flying saucers and stuff hanging around bases and checking them out and stuff. And then when they started with radar, it, it, it uncloaked them and it also fucked them up fucked them up really badly and so they they would lose control and they crashed and shit like that so that's why you got all these crashes happening in the early 50s what i was told is then they they um the aliens fixed it they so that as time went on they got they got fewer and fewer crashes less of this shit happened and they fixed the problem that the flying saucers had with the radar so that's why you don't get any more they got those, the few crashes that they got, and then they tried to reverse engineer them. So he's saying like, so what did they get out of them? It was like, okay, not the transistor, the transistor, forget it. It was really shockly and it's not a much of an advance over valve and stuff. The other one, sometimes people say is Velcro. Nah, I don't think so. Velcro came from uh, this guy and his dog, he was walking this dog. He got it's from natural phenomena. He the dog got burrs on him, and then he had access to an electron microscope. He looked at the burrs and saw, you know, that there were little hooks, and that's where Velcro came from. It didn't, it's, it's not reversed alien technology. Now, the one technology, apart from say a piece of metal, which I'm not familiar with, laminate or something like that, I'm not familiar with those materials. Things. The one I was told was fiber optics. <laughs> so uh, now, now let me tell you a bit about fiber optics. So the fiber optics was is, is was known quite a long time ago. I mean, even the 1800s and stuff, they knew that you could duct a light in a fiber, in a glass fiber. By the way, the only reason why a magnetron works is because it has a waveguide. So the way the science of waveguides and stuff is you have to have a multiple of the wavelength and the, the it's very a very specialized field on the waveguide. But if you take a magnetron, say, out of your microwave oven, you might be able to electrocute yourself, but 
but it's it's not going to do much. It's just uh, you know it doesn't really work unless you you guide the electromagnetism into a cavity like your microwave oven or and that that guiding is done by a waveguide. So radar and everything only works with a waveguide. You need that duct, um, and so uh, the radiation is kind of useless without it. Uh, electromagnetic radiation. So the um, so now, <clears throat> what is a glass fiber? A glass fiber is a waveguide. It's just for a tiny, tiny, tiny short wavelength. It's the wavelength of light. Uh, so you know microns, um, and then why uh, it never mounted to anything, even though they knew about the principle that you could duct uh, light down a, a glass fiber, is because um, the uh, it, you know you had this impurities in the glass. So this is why now you see why the microwave furnace that I did was so important because it was it's all about how far you can actually uh, duct the light in fiber optics without it attenuating. So it's basically the decibel loss. And so glass couldn't be made very purely um, until, uh, you know, until, well, what I'm getting to now. Um, uh, and so, so, you know, the whole reason why we're having this call over fiber optics and the, the internet exists and stuff is because they develop uh, silica high purity um, fibers that you know could go for kilometers without without attenuating all the light. If, by the way, if if uh, it was just left left up to cables and electricity and copper, like the undersea cable, the, the Great Eastern, and those things laid across the Atlantic, uh, the internet, this current world wouldn't exist um, because the the transatlantic cable, if it was in the copper one and stuff, it it degraded. They needed to put more and more power in. The more power, then you know, hysteresis, and it basically a more inefficient it got, and it didn't last very long. It was unusable, and that's that's what will happen if you had duct um, electricity over um, wire. But it, but light will go as far as the purity of your of your waveguide, or in this case, um, this channel uh, of um, Glass uh, is uh, it, it it has complete internal refraction and that's why why it works as as a waveguide. So now here another bit of science of why it has uh, complete internal refraction. So it's kind of like a soliton wave. The light goes down it like a soliton wave down a canal, like a water canal, um, and. Uh, so you can go anywhere. You could go across the universe. What's stopping you is the the light uh, has you know the glass has impurities in it, and so it, it attenuates um, the light, and so it doesn't doesn't go very far. So it's all about how pure you can get the glass, and so it's like they got um, Corning and stuff got very pure glass from silica and something, and I think in the '60s or something. And then that was what that was made the modern world. Okay, not a lot of people know that, and that. There's probably a good reason because they don't want too much attention on that. This is what I was told. So hold on to your hat. They, I was told that they got they reverse engineered um, these uh, fiber optics from uh, Crest spaceships. Now, they didn't understand how the things worked. They they just would say you know th there was lots of fiber optic like glass fibers in the spaceship. So they could see that there was it made the spaceship work somehow. They could never figure out how, but what they would do is they would give what they keep everything compartmentalized, right? So that they, they give to say a material scientists, they give them a tiny bit of material and say, you know, this uh, is capable of doing anti-gravity. Uh, tell us how. And the guys who actually give them that they don't know how, they're just hoping that the guys will work it out. And then the guys try various shit and then, you know, gigahertz radiation stuff, try various things to maybe see if they can make some anti gravity fuel or some of that shit. And that's what they, they kind of do. So they gave the fibers, so these are very intrinsic to the thing. We don't know what they do, but, you know, can you make them work to control? 
various bits of equipment and stuff. And so obviously the guys said, okay, we'll stick a light on the side and stuff. And they, they, you know, said they're very high purity and stuff. And so you, it, it, it was a known effect of basically ducting light. Um, so, but here's the thing. They suddenly realized, well, this is, you know, we can, we can do this technology. Um, here's the thing is like, just in general, I want to introduce this to you because this is part of <clears throat> the woo stuff and my explanation for them, they're creating this stuff out of uh, our, our own minds. So, you see, what they did in effect, I believe, is something uh, close to like what happened with, say, Bone China. So, Bone China uh, was poor, came... It was an English invention, I think from Wedgwood or somebody like that. But anyway, China came traditionally from China, funnily enough. And it was this fine porcelain that was so beloved by, you know, 19th century England, addicted to tea and fine, and fine China. And so, but nobody knew the secret of how the Chinese were doing this. Turned out the Chinese were just, just making it out of very fine clay. But they didn't know that they tried to reverse in england they tried to reverse the china cup and so they tried all various things uh, to see what the trick was and i think wedgwood or somebody like that came said well i know what they're doing they're grinding up bone and then they're melting that down with the clay and then and they tried it and it was bingo we got it that's what they're doing and that's where fine bone china came from it wasn't what they were doing they were just using really fine clay that doesn't exist in England. But because they didn't know that, they made it something actually better than the Chinese thing. Fine bone China is better than the Chinese thing. So you can stimulate scientists into developing something even better. So I'm not surprised if the aliens went and looked at, say, the fiber optic stuff that they came and said, like, fuck, that's a cool idea. <laughs> we should have thought of it and, and taken it from humans back into their craft. Is because you see, I'm this is what where I'm going with this. I think if you if you get a room full of scientists and you say, okay, you just give them an object, I mean, just some exotic material or something, just you know, machine. It's a trick, right? You you machine some exotic material. I'd say you could do this test. It's a scientific test to prove my theory <laughs> of where these aliens are coming from. You get a, a, li a little object that's not not normal earth thing but you know something unusual shape maybe one of the maybe something that's 3d printed so it's in a nice uh, globe shape with very complicated and stuff and and you just put a fucking symbol on it you just stamp it with some like the extinction artist sigil let's say and you say uh you say okay this is ultra secret you you read these people into the into the program and by the way just on that score just uh, a thing on the side, most people think that the Official Secrets Act is the only thing, you know, I think laymen think that. But in all these programs, it's worth knowing that uh, these guys do, there's much, much more secret stuff that you sign and they sign away their lives. And so from what I've heard, these things are like, like medieval oaths. I mean, if you don't believe that these, the, these is, this is a secret cult, an underground cult within the government and within the deep state within the government, is that these, these oaths are fucking diabolical. I mean, they, they, they're biblical, and they want much more than, oh, you will go to jail. <laughs> I mean, they're just off the fucking charts, which is one of the reasons why these guys are so scared, because they have more than sign and blood. And so, uh, I mean, it's... It's a religious incantation. <laughs> Some of the, the seriously, seriously secret stuff. And so you must have that as a background. To, it's an important bit of subtext on what the guys will reveal and how. And so, uh, and so, and also based on that is I found out a lot more than I could because I've never taken one of these. I'm not eligible. So I'm, but I learned a lot more outside of that because of various things, but also because the people made assumptions. And so, um, but anyway, I, I know a lot more than I, I should, and I know a lot more than I could if I had a genuine security fence. But I'm not bound. All these guys like Lou um, Elizondo and stuff coming out with the stuff now, 
is those guys are, are bound by this. It's, I mean, I <laughs> basically I'm an outsider. So like what I face, I mean, I if if I trod on a landmine, I wouldn't even know it. But I, I mean, I run the risk of being whacked in the night. I mean, even for this video, <laughs> yeah. and I, I'm absolutely whackable. I mean, I, I'm out at sea at night on a boat. It's like a submarine. They don't even have to raise their periscope. They could take me out in the night. I couldn't even do a mayday call. And believe me, they would. They've done worse. They've, uh, by the way, um, the submarines take on a lot of fishing trawlers every year. It's kind of a dirty secret in the Navy, but they can't, they can't always see these, you know, Drag, trawlers dragging nets um, often submarines run into them and what happens is the, the poor guy in the trawler starts going backwards at about 100 miles an hour and he gets pulled under what they do is they just cover it up and pay up the pay out the families and stuff but it happens all the time and i'm just saying it because to say whoa i am easily rubble rubber outable if if you ever disappears mm, u.s navy <laughs> submarine in the night is a classic way they would get rid of a guy like me uh, they don't even have to, you know, bat an eyelid. So anyway, I'm saying that, that I, I maybe if I trod on a landmine and I, you know, revealed something or re revealed too much or something, it's like I wouldn't even know I I overstepped the mark. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not I'm not eligible for Guantanamo Bay and lifetime in prison or tortured to death or whatever the secret because I never, I never agreed to any of that stuff. Anyway, so that's the background. Anyway, so getting back to my theory of what's going on. If you hear, and this is testable in a lab, if you give a group of scientists and you know, hard-headed guys and stuff, some kind of object stamped with a sigil and you say it does something, it like does anti-gravity, it can cloak itself invisibly or something, and you just say, shove it at them. And so they'll work on it. And so you you run the risk or maybe the benefit of of them actually doing it because uh, they will convince themselves and engineer themselves into a new bit of technology like bone china or you know fiber optics. Here's what I think has happened. What you're really doing is you're convincing them of their own psychic abilities and their own paranormal abilities is really what's happening. The science and stuff, they just need it as a crutch to convince themselves that it's real. But when, once they've used that science on themselves, that's almost like a spell that breaks open their own cities. Cities, S-I-D-I, I think so that's from the other side, the Wu side that I come from. You see, I've seen the city. I've done the cities. I know the city. I've, I've had various effects, which if you torture me, I will tell you about. But the... But so I know the city side. I have no problem with that. And I know the science side. And so they, they merge with me because I'm saying what the scientists are doing it without knowing it. They think they're doing hard science. And I think that they they actually unlocking their own cities so that they come to these new things. They say, oh, no, it's all mundane. And they show you these all these mundane steps and they make the science mundane. And they don't realize that it's, yeah, they're, they're edging on the edge of their own cities. So uh, let me explain it to you this way, because I'll, now I'll explain it to you from the Wu side, not the scientific side. So from the Wu side, um, <clears throat> I, I'd say like I spend a lot of time Sri Ramakrishna and all that. I hope you guys know who Sri Ramakrishna is. If you if you don't, here's a little recap. Sri Ramakrishna is a famous uh, Bengali saint and mystic, and uh, he just I think he died in. 1888, somewhere around there. But anyway, he just made it almost into the modern era. So he's kind of like Chaitanya or Buddha or somebody like that. But we have no, not much historical evidence. We just have the last remnants of historical evidence of one of these God figures. And so there are three photographs of him, three photographs of an actual picture of like, the Buddha, in other words. It's to say, you can see his status evolving, Sri Ramakrishna in his. He's kind of Godhead. I think I, the last time I looked, if you say, I believe they're getting to the stage in Chennai or Madras, what they were, that if you deny Sri Ramakrishna as God, you can actually go to jail now. I do believe that is the case. 
but it's amazing because it's the development of Christ. We're looking 100 years into the development of Christ. The great thing about Sri Ramakrishna is there's still sources, like newspaper articles and stuff, that you can go back and figure out the real story. So I keep on telling this to, you know, people who study comparative religion and say, you can see the birth of Christ in Sri Ramakrishna, and it's all there. You can study it in the thing, how all the, what, what's going on. The whole phenomena of Christ is there in Sri Ramakrishna unfolding for you. I never got any one of these guys to, to go into it because they kind of, I think, don't want to know the trick. <laughs> they want, they're kind of religious and they don't want to destroy their religion. But anyway, I did. I went and studied Sri Ramakrishna from both sides, from the scientific, because it's such a unique thing. Now, Sri Ramakrishna. Okay, well, if you ever ask me, somebody did recently, was, was what's your most influential book or something I'd say, I'd have to say probably the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. So, mm, cool, little funny thing there when I said that. Anyway, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is on the well on the other side of the fence from tech and it's on woo. So the Sri Ramakrishna in the Gospel of, uh, in the Gospel, so he tells the story or he tells parables all the time. And one of the parables he says is very, very revealing. And he actually, in a lot of ways, is revealing uh, the secret to cities and we listen up. <laughs> the story goes something like this. If I par I'll have to pra paraphrase, but it's basically an, uh, an Indian guy, an ordinary peasant guy, um, not a high caste guy and stuff he comes to a uh, brahman faker you know a wise man holy man and says as in indians often do like i've got this problem i'm um, i have to cross this river every day and i'm getting scared and scared to cross the river because it's filled with crocodiles and um i have to wade across there's no bridge and i'm getting scared and scared occasionally the river floods and i can't get to work and i need some 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 help and so the 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 faker says okay there's no problem i will grant you the cities to walk on water you can just walk across the water every day walk across the river and then say oh fantastic and say like okay he says here let me do it and he gets this bunion leaf or banana or whatever and he scribbles something on the leaf folds it all up and then gives it to the guy and says, like, just strap this, just get a thread, strap it to your ankle. You'll be able to walk across the river. And the guy does it and it works like a charm and he walks on water every day. Uh, the faker says, like, whatever you do, don't unwrap the thing uh, and don't have a look inside. So you know where this is going, of course, that as the guy is going across the river, he starts to get curious and he goes like, you know, I wonder what the fake actually wrote in the thing and what he did. What is inside the leaf that allows me to, to walk on water? And for a while he can suppress his curiosity, but the more he thinks about it, the more he thinks, you know, there must be a seriously powerful spell in there. Maybe, maybe if I get hold of that spell, if I look at what the spell was, I could use it, I could do get these powers and stuff and anyway this thinking gets the better of him eventually he can't contain his curiosity and one day while he's walking across the river he think he's he is overpowered by curiosity to the extent that he pulls out the leaf unfolds it to have a look what's inside and he he sees that what the faker has done he's just like scratched with a nail the name of god rama he just he's just written rama scratched on a leaf and the guy goes fuck it that's it he just like scratch Rama on a leaf is like a fucking fraud. And then instantly he sinks through the water and drowns. Okay. Now, do you understand <laughs> what this story is saying? It's, it's many layered, right? Uh, there are a lot of ways to see it. You know, for a dipshit will take uh, some. But this is the story of the mind here that, that like, as soon as you want to focus down on one thing, you, you lose everything else, and and the yeah, mind. It's really belief. It's kind of belief. You see, there, 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 there are lots of ways to read it. That 
Some but in terms of the UFO yeah, thing, because just belief. I was thinking in terms of the UFO thing because yeah, the, I, I was thinking belief too exactly. And then he's like, "Oh, this is all bullshit." He just wrote, and then he sinks because you stop believing that you can walk on the water. So it's sort of like it, what the like, the scientists are doing. They're oh, believing yeah, that it's alien technology, and they're reinforcing that in you know their group. They're like yeah, sort of creating an egregore. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it, so it's getting back to what he said. It's a parallel to what you said about making the suggestion to the scientists. But but I was thinking more back earlier in the conversation where we were talking about our separation from the universe. It, part of that uh, no, is... No, no, don't go there idea yet. No, don't. That's too much. Oh, okay. Go, All right. Shut up. I'll shut up. So, so, so okay. So, uh, so, you see, DB got it. The, the what 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 Shira, the faker the the holy man has done is he's not, he hasn't done anything and the faker knows it the faker knows that the the telepathic powers the ability to walk on water is in the guy all he did was trick the guy into believing into his own powers and so that's that's the trick that's the trick of so I've, I've experimented with this and I've done this because almost by accident because when you sort of get to a certain stage you start fucking gaslighting yourself and you start to realize you have cities and so okay mine was control control of animals but like you know you start to think oh fuck it i'm losing my mind you are losing your mind <laughs> if you think of it as an alien cortex but but uh you know you I, because I had the scientific side, I, I didn't just go like, oh, yay, I've got cities and stuff. <laughs> I knew this was really dangerous because it's uh, most likely magical thinking and you're going psychotic and uh, you're going to get locked up if you carry on like this. So I very cautiously did science experiments and myself and obviously one is to check with other people that, that I'm not fooling myself and making this up. Don't say anything, Gary. <laughs> so... Oh, <laughs> okay, Gary, what? what? I, I'm just suggesting that obviously you don't uh, even think about using these techniques on the extinction outie. Well, I sort of did some, <laughs> like, how I came up with the that picture for the, um, for the solstice and, like, like that writing I did, that came from some voice I can't explain. Like I was meditating on the extinction Audi symbol and carrying it with me for weeks. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like building up the teapot and then that explosion happened and I got possessed by something and I cranked that stuff out in like two days. So it's sort of okay, like but, that. Okay, but you see, okay, I'm gonna, I'll give you some extra information on this that I don't think even Sri Ramakrishna and these Indian fakers and, and, and that, um, realize and that's that i think there's a general belief in in india and stuff that that you have to trick the guy so in other words it's kind of in the story that if he knew the trick he'd fall uh fall and drown below the waves but, but you see what both of what db saying now and gary is like yes i'm using all of this stuff on you but here's the thing is I can tell you what they don't know is I can tell you it's the placebo effect. You see, like what they found with placebos as well, that like placebos seem to be being perfected. Now you know why. <laughs> they may, they what placebo what big pharma is doing with placebos and all the testing is unlocking everybody's cities for health. <laughs> and so they see the placebo getting more and more effective and drugs getting less and less effective. And so, what you know, we're spending gargantuan billions of money in medical research, and we're perfecting the placebo. We're not. What we're really doing is, I think, a lot of health. You know, woo health practitioners would agree that we're perfecting people's belief in their own abilities to heal themselves. But let's not go into the health thing. So the so uh, here's the thing: what they found with placebos, they thought too. The placebos scientists thought that placebos only worked because of the trick. They fooled you into, you know, this auto suggestion. And then they found amazing thing, and that's no placebo worked even if you told the person it's a placebo. You say here, the, you 
you're on part of the so in other words you unblind the the test and you you say you are in the placebo group and you are in the control group and you are in the medicated group and it's like you can tell everybody it doesn't change the result they always thought it had to be blind and you know the placebo effect to take effect they had to believe it was a medicine and stuff no it, it goes so deep you can actually tell people so i can actually do this to you what gary's <laughs> saying is are oh, you do yes i'm doing this to you but the thing is it's you see i all i'm doing is i'm i'm unlocking it in you and what a lot of you know fakers and totally men that don't know is i can tell you too it still works so we're safe all all the way around anyway let's get back to <coughs> fiber optics and stuff like that. so okay so if um if i'm right um if what i was told was right and fiber optics comes from this root and stuff um uh it's um it's very i think you you can see what i'm saying here that 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 if you okay i must reveal a bit more now about those reverse engineering projects and stuff so what have they reverse engineered very little the only thing they've reverse engineered are things that are kind of trivial well hugely impactful in in the case of fiber optics but not not flying cars and anti-gravity and you know teleportation and they, they haven't got any of that <clears throat> and so here's the thing i asked to see i was told you know okay how do these things actually work and stuff and they say well the reason why we can't really reverse engineer them is because they these com they have components and things and they stamped with symbols they know that the symbols are very very important for the working of the machine they can't figure out how the <laughs> how the symbols work so i've been told that you can they you know they they can do it they can put the symbols on stuff but they don't understand what the language is or what these things do so so you can put the symbol on stuff and i've been told that things will self assemble they can put you know, a few parts that they found together on the actual machine, they put all the right symbols on, and the thing will self-assemble into this other component. <laughs> they don't know what that component is. And they will also put a symbol on one thing, and it'll affect some other component on the other side. They don't know how these things work together or what they do, so they're kind of fucked. But now think of it. <clears throat> think of it back in, like, Sri Ramakrishna and stuff with, with the Rama written on the leaf. It's, it's just a sigil. So, it's, so my theory on how these craft work, if you say they are little green men, which I don't, but, but is that the little green men are they're using all the, their own brains to fly the machine, even assemble the machine, and not in the way we do. With, we, you know, we kind of, why are we so primitive is because we, have, we believe that you have to assemble things by hand and you know, and have scientific ideas and mechanism and be able to explain the mechanism in a mundane kind of what steam engine kind of way <clears throat> so that Michael Shermer, the cop inside us, is happy. And then that, that's the only way we can squeak through to the past. But they, they can short circuit that and say, nah, man, this is all just cut out the middleman. You don't have to get a lathe and machine the shit. Just do it if you mind. And, the, and so that's how the guys would be creating the machine, the little green men. The, it's in, it's, you, they know that whether the component self-assembles or does some telekinetic kind of activity or something like that is based on the, the observer. So it's based on the state of the person observing the mindset. They know that that has something to, to do with it then you can see the world they're in. They're in, the, they're in Lionel's world and the world of magic. And it's, it's, they're back to the very old stuff of witches and wizards and John D and stuff. And there's Enochian angels and demons and stuff. And they said, like, this is just fucking magic. They're just putting fucking Harry Potter shit. They're just putting a magic spell on the thing. And it does a Walt Disney. But you say, yeah, that's, that's the realm we're in. But they haven't got it yet that that 
They're not little green men. They created the little green men. They created this whole fucking thing. Right? So even the even though they have bodies and stuff, you see, why? <clears throat> you see, okay, ask a simple question. Like, do they have living aliens? So like, no, of course they don't have living aliens. Because if they had living aliens, what, what you would do is you just hold a gun to the guy's head and say, like, fucking tell me how this works. <laughs> and it's like, the yeah, they everybody knows that they've been trying and trying for like 70 years to without much success apart from huge success like like uh fiber optics they, they they haven't been able to get anywhere with this with this stuff and if they had living guys to torture they would just torture the fuck out <laughs> until they told them so do they have bodies yeah well imagine they have bodies but you know because they were crashed car now now to them and this is the dangerous part is they would say hugh you're talking shit we have bodies we have machines we, we have craft man so these guys are real they're coming from outer space and i'm saying they wouldn't believe me that i say no they're coming from your head you manifested them and i said look man they real. you can knock on that look at this you know smack me on the head with a piece of you know exotic material i'd say yes you still don't get it. The human brain is so powerful that it can actually manifest these things in the concrete. And that's the yeah. thing that they know. Can I, can I, again, I, I want to, can I drag it back to the more fundamental thing? It's, oh, it's yes, not may now. Yeah, look, just to put it in, in simplistic speak, if you can bear with it, if you were God and you, you know, you woke up one morning and thought, oh, fuck, it's so bloody boring. I'm going to make the universe today. You know, and so you, you get out of bed and you start making the, you know, okay, it's so many squillion billion megatons of hydrogen and then helium and iron and I pile it all up and get it all ready. And I think suddenly at lunchtime I stop and think, what the fuck am I doing? I don't have to actually create stuff. I've only got to create the effect. Um, so, I mean, you know, and and we we're, we're God in this very profound sense, not in some trivial sense. You know, um, and so you know we're we're not actually making these bodies and machines and these alien things. There isn't any stuff. We're create we're creating what what convinces us of the existence of these things it's it's like i'm sure most people have had a kind of a dream where you you might dream the solution to some problem or, or some kind of strange object and it's just so bloody impressive in the dream and it's so plausible and you've solved your problem you've created whatever you and you wake up and find that all you did was create the sensation of the satisfaction of of that thing but you didn't create the solution and you didn't create the thing. You only created the, the, the final thing, which was the feeling that it would have produced and the, and the, the satisfaction from it. And, you know, I mean, at, at a sort of very profound level of the universe, isn't that what's happening here? That, that you know... Yes, it's very simple you, because you, so very you know, simple. you're... Yeah, yeah, that's what I want to just bring it back to this very fundamental thing, rather, because otherwise, if you bring it up a level to say that, well, their minds are being goaded to to access the supposed cities and, and, and therefore be able to create this alien, recreate or create this alien technology, is bringing it up to a level where people are going to start misinterpreting the possibilities here and get carried away. I think that's where it becomes woo-woo. That's where the danger is there. You, you is. say that to the wrong person. Apprentice, yeah. They, they, don't, mm. they don't know what, they, what they're what doing. So it's very much sort of important. But just to go further to what you said, then just ground it in very simple logic. Okay, so okay, so we're talking, like you said, like God. So we're God and we don't know we're God. So, you know, this is, so the thing is, why don't we have the power to like move shit at will? You know, why don't I move this coffee cup and stuff? And he said, because you, you God, you have the power of God. So if you don't believe that you God, um, 
you have the superpower to stop you moving the cup is is equal or as great as your ability to move the cup. The, the cup. So it's like it sounds a bit, a bit like a hack motivational speaker and stuff when when you say all that. But you know, if you say you, we don't know our own powers, therefore we don't know the power that's stopping us unleashing those powers. I mean, it sounds very trite and you know hack you know motivational speaker, but they are kind of right in the in in that way. Um, but it, it's it works like like you said in a, like a dream. So okay, so now in this right. There's no you get into solipsism very quickly because you say how many gods are there? <laughs> There's only one. But a lot of people, okay, let's go through, while we're on simplistic arguments and stuff. Uh, in a sophomoric kind of teenage way, people will say no, solipsism can't be true because of things like they use stupid arguments, log logical, logically flawed arguments, like saying can't be true. Because there are people like Shakespeare in the world, and there are people like Mozart in the world, and you can't write Mozart, and you can't write Shakespeare. Therefore, there must be other minds in the world. I say, no, moron. <laughs> You're not thinking it through. Think of it, if you want to understand solipsism, think of it like a dream. That's a good go to thing. So, it's saying like, what that argument is saying is I come out and say, like, I had this amazing dream last night. It's like Mozart was, I dreamt I, you know, walked into a room. There was Mozart playing the piano, fucking beautiful music. And they'd say, no, you couldn't have had that dream. Say, so, oh, I did, I did. I really had that dream. Say, no, you couldn't. Why? Said, Why couldn't I? Because you can't play the fucking piano. And you certainly can't play it as well as Mozart. I say, no, I, as I said, it was the dream Mozart. You can say, but how could he? <laughs> it's like, look, I dreamed that it was good music and I dreamed it was Mozart and I dreamed the whole fucking thing. <laughs> and that's the bit that they go and get. And so, like, you know, you can also dream other minds, you know, <laughs> cut to the chase. So, so anyway, yeah. I'm telling you all this, I, think, I hope you're getting all of this and it's not being misconstrued. But it's so, so any, what the, the long and the short of this is, I'm trying to warn you off um, what I think is about to happen. And this is a whole lot of paranormal shit and stuff. And I thought I could just tell you, um, you know, like as we get closer to the flipping, this, yeah, people are going to go barking mad. And this is one of them. But you're talking about people with superpowers going barking mad. And I realize I have to tell you a bit about this because you know, they have the superpower to manifest a fucking flying machine that comes down and lands on the fucking earth. And, or, or to go to nuclear war. With things. See, see, go back to those guys in the, in the, the F-19s, right, and those Super Hornets and stuff. Those Navy pilots, but this is dangerous shit, right? Because if they're creating that Tic Tac object and these things that are splashing in that, and they're doing, I've seen it, I've seen it in the, in the Air Force, and it works by suggestion. Everybody's working on themselves. And so, so you know, the, say the fighter control, this, imagine this scenario. So the fighter control, they look in radar and stuff, and they see these tracers, and they go like, fuck, what the hell is that? Jesus, look at the speed, man. They're working themselves up in a very simple way. Now, you're saying like, uh, people will say, Michael Shermer, if Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer has to advance and get over his, oh, this is just bullshit ufology for current cranks and kooks. It's like, well, you, you know, this is why things are advancing because that's no longer available to libtards because the, you know, the Pentagon has come out and said, no, these are sh real shit. So sorry, Michael Shermer, you've got to, you've got to shift, man. <laughs> it's like it's time, time for a little realization here. And so, so uh, you know, that rug has been pulled out from under them. So now you say, okay, these, these are, are real things. Um, but, uh, you know, um, what, what exactly, um, you know, uh, what exactly are they? And it's like a real stretch to say, well, you know, we're manufacturing them out of our heads. But if they, if Michael Schumer's believed that we should be now that these things are real, then he would say, okay, Hugh, you've got to be wrong. These can't be telepathic. These guys can't be creating this because, wait for it, they are, they have FLIR cameras. These are things on film. They have them in computers. They have cross-corroboration with 
with the the radar guys the radio guys have those radars tra traced recorded you can piece all these things together from 15 different angles these are real physical objects and i say yeah so think it through we have the power so to actually do psychotronics if you go back right to the beginning when i was telling you we we can affect the electronics to the extent we can make a false image on your hard drive <laughs> So, so here's how it works. If you type, put all this together, you see the guys on the radar scope. They're looking and getting themselves all excited, building up DMT and stuff, even before the fucking pilots got into his cockpit. So already there's a big buzz. So now there's also telepathy involved. The pilot who's just done his briefing and stuff, he, he's also thinking this is going to be an unusual day can't tell why but he's getting a lot of these ripples even suggestions just people's expressions and stuff but there's some shit going on so he's pretty keyed up by the time he gets in his cockpit then he takes off and then they vector him to towards this this thing and you know now he's starting to say hey i'm getting a trade too and then more excitement and they say yeah well we didn't want to tell you but there's a whole fleet of those fucking ua you know uaps out there and he says like we you know they back to him to intercept and stuff and you see how they're working on each other they're all building each other up to believe this whole thing and eventually the guy uh in that one thing with the, the hornet pilots then he goes in to investigate and then he says well the tic tac thing is responding to me <clears throat> he's basically doing maneuvers <clears throat> in conjunction with me and so you say well the obvious explanation is it's him it's his own thinking rather than a little green man in the tic tac and the proof of that is is that then they say well the the tic tac goes to the cap point or what we would call the rendezvous point but the <clears throat> the the um you know they get completely gaslit because they say you know the, the cap point is is secret effectively it's only the pilot the briefing guys the ops guys the guys in radar and stuff they know they're the only ones that know so so if you believe that they're little green men and then the, the, these guys miraculously know where the cap point is and this tic tac goes there and waits for the pilot to to arrive there what you're saying is these guys actually know I mean, you know, they're telepathic. They can look at the briefing, <clears throat> all of that. And so how likely is that? It's not logically consistent because if they're that powerful, you know, A, they wouldn't need the experiments the, if this is a Petri dish. You know, B, who gives a fuck about nuclear weapons? They could just fucking, you know, affect our brains so that we wouldn't launch them. You know, it, it, it makes no sense. Why are they trying to prove to us that they're so fucking clever and, and like the guys think? So there's a more obvious explanation, and that's that, that it's almost a proof. The fact that you had this closed bit of knowledge where the rendezvous point or the cap point was is only known by a few individuals. So the go-to reasonable things to say that it's it is those individuals that are creating the phenomena and so you know you could that's almost a kind of a proof of it but i must tell you now about this you know big spaceship coming down so so okay now i'm telling you not to get on the spaceship and i've got to tell you that my reasoning for it it's it's just a logical deduction that you'd never want to do it a lot by the way a lot of these people think, and I'm talking Mormons and <laughs> all these guys all infiltrated in the military. And the <laughs> they think two things. One of them is interplanetary war. The other one is this is the rapture, guys. This is the Bible. You, you know, will you, um, will, will you remember? Harry, God's an okay. alien. Stuff. Not now. Not now. So yeah, God's an alien. God's going to come down. And then, you know, from Mormons think from Kolob, it's a planet just, 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 just off the cloaked, I presume. But anyway, they think that God's going to come down and take everybody up. Now, go through this thing where I'm saying to you, yeah, we could get this collective hallucination, you know, elevate the Pentagon with the power of our, our collective city. Yeah, we could create this fucking spaceship. But here's the thing. Would you get on it and say, like, no, logically, you wouldn't get on it. 
Now, I hope if this thing comes down that I'm not steering you completely wrong because this, they could have serious consequences for listening to me. Not so much the flipping. You know, I, as far as I can see, there are no serious consequences. This, I could seriously influence you in a way that could really fuck you up. So take what I say, really think about it carefully and decide what you want to do. I would never get on that spaceship, and I'll, I'll tell you the logical why. See, all these guys, you know, we're talking the spaceship thing is the space encounters, uh, close encounters of the third kind of movie, right? So it, it, that's what all these fucking egotistical little fuckheads uh, believe is that we're so fucking special and the aliens are doing this experiment and it's all about us. And then, you know, they, they you know, event, you know, then they take us up and we all the worthy go to heaven and stuff. And it's like, how likely is that? It's like, guys, if this is all an experiment in a petri dish, it's obviously a failed experiment, right? So if if they take all of these guys, if it's a if it's a big experiment the aliens are doing, and they take all the, they just taking them up for recycling. So look, you precious little fucks. Would would anybody take us off this planet? We just fucked an entire planet. Do you honestly think they're going to take all these precious little libtard darlings to their own planet? As I said in the fucking introduction on the serious website, if, if we're in fucking alien cortex quarantine, there's nobody in the fucking universe that had any intelligence that would touch us with a fucking barge pole, let alone take, you know, 8 billion people off to this fucking rapture in heaven. It's like they, they're just going to take you and put you in a fucking gas chamber. This is what I've been hinting at, whether well, you take that left path of Paul Kings North and these guys, get on, you'll get on the fucking spaceship and that's a gas chamber. So it's like, they're only going to recycle you. It's like, you know, look at the logic this way. Is what would this heaven be like? If you go up to this this heaven in, in the class, it's like everybody goes, way, you know, close encounters of the third kind, you know, bye-bye planet, we leave it to the animals. And you, because I'm not fucking get, I'm hiding in a fucking cave. I intend to be the last man left alive. And if all you fucks get on the thing, I'll say, bye, assholes. <laughs> I'm in paradise. You're fucked. So it's like, and why are you fucked? But where would they take you? We evolved for this planet. This is Eden. This is paradise. This, it doesn't get better than the earth we fucked up. So all these guys, these communists and these Kings Norths and these Christians and these Mormons, they, I mean, what's going to happen to them? At the very best, they're going to take you into some simulation, which is like a farm upstate or something, put you out to pasture. And if you're a communist, you go like, oh, now we get our communist utopia. And you say, yeah, yeah, we'll give it to you on VR if you like. It's the kindest thing they could do to these idiots. And then, you know, you'd be there in, in, in your communist heaven and you'd go like, well, this is fucking great. And it's like, what should we do this afternoon? Should we watch a movie? What movies have we got? Well, they're just the same old Pravda things about the end of history and stuff. And you know, oh, that's fucking boring. I'm sick of that. Is there anything else to do? No, nah, that's about it, really. It's the end of history, communist utopia. Oh, fuck. Where the fucking anarchists? Where did they go to? Because I feel like a bit of excitement, a bit of entertainment. Let's fuck up some anarchists like communists normally did on Earth. So, like, well, they went into their own little VR thing. We don't know where they are. It's just communists here, and we don't want to fuck up a communist. So it's like, can you see? It's hell. It's not fucking heaven. Yeah, that reminds me on um, what. Yeah, what you're. Christian when you go up. Yeah, what it. you're saying, like, because I was talking, my brother and I were talking. He was really hammering on about Christianity, and then you know I was like, you know, going through it with him, like, no, afterlife ain't real, you know. God is our consciousness. It's not out there in heaven. And then he got pissed off and he's like, okay, then what's your solution? I'm like, a reunion. And he's like, what reunion? Humans with Earth? <laughs> that reunion? Yeah, exactly. Well, this is what I'm I'm saying. So, so like, okay, let's go through the Christian version of that. We don't so <clears throat> so you're a Christian and you're like, yay, it's the rapture. Who you, you know, hey, I didn't realize it makes all the sense in the world now. God's an alien, all right. And here, all the angels are aliens. Well, said it in the book, said it in Ezekiel, if chariots in the sky, duh, of course, makes sense now. It's all about aliens, all comes together nicely. We get on the spaceship and go to heaven. Okay, and day one. It's 
that what happens now well you christian heaven it's like all right so what we sit at the table here on the right hand of god yeah yeah it's all that really happens here yeah hmm. um can we have meat here i mean i'm kind of missing meat you could you know is this heaven and paradise are we allowed to eat meat well, nobody's ever asked that before, but oh, sure, sure, we can put that. What kind of meat would you like? No, lamb. Lamb? Fuck it. <laughs> Off to hell with you. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't mean lamb. I mean, cow. I mean, maybe that's why they're doing all the cattle mutilations. They're basically getting a big feast up in the sky for you, where they, they know we like beef, and you've been vegetarian for so fucking long because of all these... Gretas and stuff, and you're like, you must be really sick of it. So in heaven, they've got a big, you know, steak emporium. It's basically Douglas Adams at the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and at the restaurant in the other end of the universe. You you have prime rib. You're allowed to eat as much as you like now at the right hand of God. But it, if you follow through these scenarios, you go like, this is really going to get fucking boring after the first day. And so, you know, if you put you in Westworld or in a simulation of your best thing, you, you're going to choke on that. <laughs> so, so where would they take you on this fucking spaceship that, that, that is better than what we've got? There's no way, you fucking idiot. We evolved for this. So that even if it is a fucking Petri dish experiment, we are all the creatures of the Petri dish. <laughs> we can't, why would we feel comfortable anywhere other than a Petri dish? Think it through. But all, all these little fucking self-obsessed little assholes think that it's all so precious and human life is incalculably valuable and Russell Brand jerks himself off on the fucking YouTube and stuff. It's like, no, <laughs> we, we're not. We're, we have cities and stuff and all that and stuff and we're special in a way because we're the only life in the universe and stuff, but not in that way. Not, not in that special little goody two-shoes way. Sir, we're can I say something? Superpowers, right? we, we're, not, we're a bug with superpowers. We, we, you know, that's it. Um, Alan Watts went through this really beautifully in one of the talks that he gave. And uh, he, he did it as a thought experiment where he said to people, hey, you know, if you could have anything you wanted, you know, and go through the whole fucking thing, you know, he said, look, you'd go through all of the fucking pleasures and and then you'd get bored and then you'd push it even harder and you'd, you know, decide that, okay, you know, we, uh, I can't just have what I want. I've got to introduce the element of surprise here because it gets, you know, even the extreme pleasures get boring after a while. So I've got to relinquish a little bit of control and let something pop up by random to create a bit of unexpected fun here and there and go through it all. And eventually that would wind itself down into a chamber of absolute horrors where you had no control and every kind of evil and agony would unleash itself. And uh, he kept going and going. And he said, you know, eventually he said, after you'd spent millennia going through everything that you, you know, every possible conceivable thing that you could want or imagine or experience or anything, he, he's, and, uh, and I think he finished off with something like, you know, do you know where you would end up? And basically he just said, well, yeah, you'd be sitting there in the audience listening to me tell you this story. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, you know, in that sense, it's not special. You know, it, it, just going back to what you were saying, you know, that it, it's, it, it is special, but you're not going to get some, um, oh, hell, you, you, you can't run it that way. It, it's got to it's gotta unfold for you. you. You might be unfolding it, but it's still got to unfold for you. This is really interesting territory. I, I don't know what else to say. I'll kick quiet. Well... I mean, but run through the logic of it. If if you take what I'm telling you, that we're manifesting all these fucking, even to the extent that we can wrap on them like concrete material in a lab uh, with our knuckles, um, you know, so do I think we could manifest a spaceship that came down and took us all off? Yeah, <laughs> certainly do. Certainly think that collectively we could lead ourselves down the path of encouraging our own cities and auto-suggest ourselves into that. We're well on that path. 
But so this is another way. level of uh, this is another level of mass formation psychosis. Uh, yeah, this is part of mass formation. So then, whose psychosis is it? So, like, for all I know, I'm willing all these people into a fucking spaceship mm. so they'll fuck off and leave me alone on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> That's also a very possibility. But anyway, for the you and the extinctionati, is what I'm saying to you is like, if this happens, you know, it's like, let these fucks go. It's like, don't get on that fucking thing. We'll have the fucking paradise to ourselves. And so... Will you so, put up that video? Uh, Some time ago, you put up a little video clip from one yeah. of those old black and white science fiction movies about the guy who was getting onto the... getting onto, onto uh, a, uh, an alien craft or something, you know, where the woman comes and drags him back oh, and says, no, no. no, no. no. Yeah, it, it, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, what, it, what, that what was that film? Is, I don't it, remember. It was a Twilight Zone episode. It's, it's a Twilight Sorry? Zone episode called Oh, How Twilight Zone. So it's, it's called How to Serve Man, and the, the story is these aliens come down and they bring the, this book, the Bible, okay, in case you didn't get the reference. But it, the book has on the cover, it's like How to Serve Man, and these guys come down and they make the world wonderful and solve all these problems and that, and then take everybody off in, in the spaceship. If you don't know the thing, spoiler alert, the, the woman suddenly realizes as the, the male character goes off into the craft, just like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, is suddenly realizes that she's translated it and she's realized how to serve man is a cooking book. Yeah, that's so, it. That's the one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm saying, in effect, that it's like if you get on that craft, it's like the, the aliens are taking up this. At the very best, they're taking up a failed experiment. In other words, they're going to chuck the petri dish in, in the in the toilet. Uh, I mean, if they're really kind to the, you know, experimental animals, then they'll put you out to pasture. And if you're lucky in some VR thing or some manufactured hell on, you know, somewhere up in the Pleiades. I mean, we're not evolved for the Pleiades. It's going to suck, man. So it's like, so that's the best you could hope for. But I mean. You know, the, the danger for the extinctionati, if you follow me and my logic, is that you, you would stay down on Earth. And then you just hope that they don't fucking say, oh, well, that's the ex ex end of the experiment and nuke Earth. But, the, you know, why would they? I mean, if, if the experiment's over and they take all the, you know, may, maybe they were trying to, maybe what they do is seed planets, grow alien cortexes, and reap the harvest. Highly unlikely, because look what this fucking thing has done. But anyway, okay, if if that's the thing, it's like, great, so you go off into the alien cores. What do you, you become pets of theirs or something? I mean, they're vastly more intelligent. It's basically Elon Musk's thing where these guys are, you know, what are you going to be? You're going to be their slave or whatever. I mean, it's not going to be cool. <laughs> They're going to dominate you. Yeah, what what you're saying also kind of reminds me of that uh, that uh, Keanu Reeves movie. It was uh, The Day the World Stood Still, that remake. He came there to start up a process of these nanomachines to wipe out humanity because, you know, humans are destroying the planet. He wanted to save Earth because he's like, Earth is like one of five planets in the entire cosmos with life. So he starts the process, and then later on in the in the movie, uh, the lady that's with him convinces him, okay, you know, I see this other side of humanity. Some of you want to make it right and stop destroying. But if I do this, it's going to come at a cost. And what's he do when he shuts down his nanomachines? He completely collapses civilization. The entire power grid goes down. The oil refinery stops, completely shuts the machine down. He's like, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, so if they, if they shut down them, so so you think they're really some good guys in this? Like there's some frozen chosen like Kings North things and stuff. It's like, I, I mean I've, I've been try. I mean, no Christian has taken me down yet, but fuck have they tried? I mean, I'm talking legally, talking take a hit on me. <laughs> so I'm talking some serious shit. None of them has succeeded yet, but I mean, like, that's the essence of Christianity. You saw it with Kings North in the microcosm because he said he came back later and said, like, well, I know I wasn't very Christian. He said, well, no, that's exactly Christian. You'd be an utter little shit. 
and then basically you come you come back later and try and forgive yourself and absolve yourself of your sins and patch it all up. Well, fuck you. I'm not a Christian. I don't forgive. I just say like, you're a Christian. Fuck off. You're going to hell. So it's like it's like, and you get to hell because, you know, some somebody says I don't forgive you. So forgive me if you want. Do the Christian thing. I'm putting you in hell. There, bing, you're in hell. I and didn't reciprocate. Fuck it, you. It's and then interesting. The Christians have no, no let out. You can either turn the other cheek and forgive you, in which case you you you, you win, or you know. But anyway, they don't win that way. So if you follow the logic, there are no frozen chosen. Or we all shits that way. The alien cortex is a shit. It's a planet destroying shit. You know, they're not good ones and bad ones. <laughs> and, and it's funny because with that whole Christian mindset of sin and resentment, all that, that mindset itself is hell. You don't need to die. You're already in hell with that mindset. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, as, as soon as you believe that there's a big personification of your alien cortex, male patriarch, huge in the sky, you're in hell from there on out. You're in hell if you don't deal with this little patriarch in your head. But so it's like, okay, so I mean, this is fucking obvious to me. I hope I'm convincing you of my argument for like, you know, stay on Earth, hope all these fucks go off in the, in the spaceship, and, uh, and let's hope they just leave the Petri dish and we can carry on. So um, one one pursuit which might help is to instead of taking pot shots at, at alien craft is to take pot shots at the air force to 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 delete some of the main creators of the of the uh, illusion. Or just I mean you see, if the guys in the Pentagon saw this video, it it might uh, take their city away. So if if anybody actually watched this video and said like maybe this character has something here and then you know suddenly the phenomenon was going right down and he's like it goes the other way too right so but anyway yeah, i say so, this yeah. i'm saying all of this to you because it's it's all part of the manifesto and the flipping so a lot of people have said to me you know and they say to me continually getting these things people say on both sides very interesting because Nobody's listening. Nobody's reading the manifesto. They're they're all they're all interpreting everything wrong, and it's like it's like hurting egos, right? It's just everybody's scattered. <laughs> oh, I haven't got enough time. <laughs> but it, so, but it's very funny because I hear both. People have said to me like, "Well, I know you said that the, I know you've said that the flipping is just a metaphor." Uh, blah, 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 blah. And so and then the other guy said, like, now, I know you've said that it is a physical event and it's not psychological, but how does that fit in? Why do you keep on going off on the woo? They say, like, you haven't listened. If, if you, if any one of those two resonate with me, listen now carefully. It's very hard to understand, but listen carefully. The flippening is both. It is a psychological thing. It is a metaphor. It is a prophecy. It's a parable. It's also a geophysical event that Michael Shermer could look at, if, if only he would, like Elliot Jacobson wouldn't. <laughs> it's like, it's just <clears throat> if you look at it, you'd be like, fuck, you cannot fault the science in that. So, yeah, you won't be. You won't be able to fault the woo in it either. See, what, what, what we do in what our alien cortex does is compartmentalize everything. We haven't got this concept that, like, the world doesn't exist in the boxes that you put it in. If you put things in categories and label shit and stuff, that's your fucking funeral. I mean, literally, that's your fucking funeral. But the world doesn't go into a box like that. So we don't have a concept of, you know, we say like, okay, okay, psychology is over here. And we'll, you know, maybe it's woo. We don't understand consciousness, but we can draw a little line around consciousness and woo. And then we can talk about science. And then we can talk about geophysics and the flipping. And these two don't know. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that. We haven't got a concept of like, the, the observer is going to fucking flip the earth. I mean, the more you look at the earth, if I can, I can take this two ways. If I can show you the science, Michael Shermer's side of you, the science, and say, say you know, well, this is really, really going to happen here. I can see it and I can't argue against it. And this is casting. Then 
what I've done is I've done the woo side. So I can I can make you flip the earth because I just unlocked your cities to fucking and I used science to do it. And I can also go from the woo side just as well and just say, okay, you, you believe the earth is going to flip. You'll, you'll flip it too. So you see that these are, this, people are not used to the idea that you can have <clears throat> a psychological thing. Say, okay, it's a metaphor. Yeah, it is all that. So it's a metaphor. So everything comes together in the flipping. <laughs> yeah, it's say, funny. Oh, wait, then you... Then you um, uh, transhumanist. Oh, is this Rakers? So Rakers well, was right. This is the singularity. No. See, each one of these guys are substitutions for the real event. So Rakers will says, oh, this is the singularity. This is the rapture of the nerds. This is when all our technology comes. I say, no. That's a substitution to avoid what's really going to happen. And then you, on the other side, you get you get like Klaus Schwab and stuff. You're saying, like, we're going to do the Great Reset. You say, yeah, the Great Reset is coming. Oh, this is this is the communist utopia I've been doing my whole life. Yeah, we get it. You say, no, we don't. That's you and your fucking ego and your Klaus schwab thing and stuff. So you're getting a Klaus Schwab is a false prophet in that's fooling himself. He, he's he's he is uh, imagining this great reset as a premonition of the real one. But you see, all of these scenarios, the Ray Kurzweil one, the Klaus Schwab, and they all have one thing in common, that they're in there and they're in top. You know, they come out as king. They, you know, Klaus Schwab secretly is king of this one world order. All, all these transhumanists, all the guys who... Or, well, um, you know, in the Pentagon, the one world guys, the eco health guys, even even all of these guys, the globalists and that somewhere is, is it, and then we come out in the top. So in the utopia, then it's a classist utopia and then they somehow king. So even in like, you know, the muskrats is, you know, somewhere Musk is a cult leader. And in this great brave new world and stuff, then, then you know, he's thinking then I'm king of the world. And you say, well, kind of, but you're selling yourself short. Because if you listen to everything I've said over and over, what Gary and I told you, it's like, you're God. It's, it's like, you don't want to sell yourself short as king of the world. Why, why do Kurzweil and all these guys say, well, we'll be superhuman. We'll have we'll be all human plus plus. We'll, be, we'll have augmented humanity and stuff. And you say, no, you're selling yourself short. Augmented God is something less than God. So, so Yuval uh, Harari and Homo Deus and all these Ayn Rand fuckheads and stuff. It's like, it's like all of these guys are selling themselves short as God. They, you know, even um, you know, Spiral Dynamics and all you know, all of that crowd. They say like, well, we will become like God or something. You don't know. You're always selling yourself short because like God, you know, we will be like Jesus. Or it's like, no, it's like you were God, you always were God, <laughs> you just didn't realize it. You continue not to be God while you you say you need you know Google Glass or you need Neuralink or something to make you God. And you say, No, Neuralink needs Neuralink to make Neuralink. God doesn't need Neuralink. To be God. Is there any of this making it? Sense yeah, at all? yeah. They're they're missing the forest for the trees. They're putting on, or they're putting on yeah, personas in, in and a, forgetting what's underneath. Yeah. But but I'm not talking flowery philosophy or concepts or you know etymology or epistemology or something. No, I'm not intellectualizing. I'm saying this is very, very physical. So if you talk about Neuralink, when I see the guys in Neuralink, I think I always have this in mind. You know, if you, if you see like Elon Musk there and he's got a remote control and he's controlling this poor fucking pig. It's like, I don't believe he's controlling the pig. I mean, I know he isn't. But, but, and the reason is... 
the Elon Musk is a con man, right? He's a, he's a faker. He's he, he's he's fooling himself, and he's fooling all the muskrats as well. So he's he's like the um, they're both off on this little dream in in this little cult, but 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 you know cult with cities. They they're creating rocket ships with the fucking imaginations, um, and and so. Uh, okay, so so when you look at the pagan stuff, you know that they're not controlling that with the electrodes going in because it's it, it, we see what Elon Musk will tell you is like, oh, we're so close to transhuman and stuff, we're going to put electrodes in people's heads and they'll be able to make phone calls. So they want to they can just dial with their mind. You just you just think. I want to contact Gary, and then you just that thought, you know, the electrodes pick it up, they dial it on the internet, it goes up to Starlink, and then you know, across the world down to Gary. Gary gets a little, oh, uh, uh, Hugh, is that you? And the, uh, you know, and all it doesn't even have to move his lips. It's just the technology sees the motor reflexes going, and then you know, connect the phone call. Horseshit, absolute fucking horseshit. These guys are fucking snake oil salesmen. There's, these these guys are like. You know, if, if you saw these guys in these guys were wandering around in the desert in ancient Egypt and stuff, and they were wandering around in biblical times, and they, they these guys would throw they tricksters. They'd throw a snake on the ground and then show you know staff on the ground, show you a snake. All these. <laughs> this is Elon Musk. He's a modern version of these snake oil salesmen. But so how how does the 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 pig work? Well, you know the pig one way the pig doesn't work with the electrodes in the head is they don't know enough about the human brain and the wetware and stuff to put, you know, electrodes in. So, I mean, think this is what they're really doing. It's it's analogous to this. You imagine all the neurons are, say, you know, Wembley Stadium with 70,000 people in it. And then, then uh, what these guys are doing is, say, from the stratosphere, they lower down these, you know, essentially tasers on the end of a, a wire into the crowd of the 70,000 football spectators, uh, spectators in, in Wembley. And then just randomly try, you know, flick, flick the tasers and tase various members in the crowd and that way control the outcome of the football game. That is, is a, a very good analogy of what they try and they and then Elon Musk and these guys are saying like yeah, and and we're doing it you know let me show you uh, I'm I can control the outcome of the football what, what do you want you want Manchester to win two 0 okay I'll I'll do that and I'm doing it with these you know these hundred uh, tasers lowered down from the stratosphere and it's like what's happening it's like it, well there's no way that he's actually controlling the outcome of the football match with that way the way he thinks he is so if you listen to me and all of this talk then you're saying well he's using the cities the the all the Neuralink crap and the augmentation and the electrodes and all the gizmos and stuff it's is just the crutch he needs it's sri ramakrishna's leaf that he needs to then you know use his own powers to affect the, the pig <laughs> So I, I did this in cartoon form. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it didn't work. But um, uh, yeah, anyway, I've been chiseling away at you guys, trying to pass this information. But how, how do you tell God that God's God and, you know, say, well, why don't I feel like God? It's because you have infinite powers. And if, if God has the power to not feel like God, then well, fucking who can go against that infinite will? Weird. I mean, I, sound, I mean, I just sound, just heard myself sounding like a, a the worst hack, motivational speaker or something. But sorry, <laughs> you either hear it or you don't. But test it. Go woo. And so anyway, that's that's as as much as I've got for the UFOs and stuff. But I, I just I just had to. I just felt the need to freaking warn people that. That section that I put in, I can't go back and put in more. I certainly can't put in what I've just told you here into the manifesto. But just understand that little paragraph is trying to say to you is we're going into mass formation. This is we're going into psychosis uh, on a on a big scale, a mass scale. Uh, but you know, don't 
get sucked into that psychosis. That's mal psychosis. It will manifest as weird shit, the weirdest shit known to man. That basically, don't be surprised if you wind up in a movie like Mars Attacks, or you know, suddenly these guys are, you know, on the White House lawn shaking hands with Biden, and you know, and that. You say like, when you see that shit. If you're an extinction artist, you'll say, back off from this. This this is their dream. It's you're you're not seeing the 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 truth. In other words, it's not conscious. They they are manifesting these things, they, they are, are bringing these things out of the paranormal uh, so that they can actually see them on television and on the White House lawn and stuff. But that it's it's you must know. That it's it's not real in the sense that there really are little men coming from from other planets. It's much yeah. more like um, just I'm just to say one more thing here. It's 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 much more like paranormal stuff. So it's it's much more like Robert Bigelow and all of, all of those the, the, those crowds and stuff. And so I I can explain all of this in much more detail if you want of why you can't take photographs and stuff um, and. I've, I've done a, a lot of stuff in, in this area, so I can share anything you want to know about it. But, but as long as, with this caveat, I don't want to draw you into this because it's mucky, right? It's drawing you off the path. It, it, it will draw you into fascination with it, and it will suck you in. So this is mucky, uh, the whole UFO thing and stuff. But it's going to get, i got a feeling, it's going to get, Fucking real in the in the sense that people are gonna start really losing their minds, like you know, like we're gonna meet, meet close encounter. Yeah, what you're saying. But we have a close encounter with our own fucking, you know, our shadow, right? Yeah. By the way, you... about the shadow, Jung Jung said pretty much what I'm saying now, but nobody heard him. Yeah, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Like, I always suspected that, you know, A, um, physical aliens never visited the planet. And I kind of thought it was sort of a psychic phenomenon, but I didn't know the specifics. But what you said made a lot of sense. It's almost like, you know, a cultish, religious phenomenon, sort of. Yeah, it seems. Okay, yeah. Yeah, what people don't understand is we, we have the power to make make a thought physical. And you think, oh, yeah, yeah, you mean we can imagine an electric motor and machine that can build it? No, I mean, you can cut out the middleman. You don't have to get a lathe and you don't have to get a welder. You, you can't just go, bink, boom, there it is on the table. Yeah, I've had an experience like that. Like, I, I've told you guys this before, but when I was in the military, they were screwed. When I was in boot camp, they screwed up like the ESL docket or whatever. So I got put on ESL for a week straight. So I got no sleep. And one of the mornings we had, you know, PT drill for an hour and I literally floated on my body and saw a gigantic like sea of ghost wolves running with me. It was fucking insane. Like, but it, I felt like it happened. Like, I know it's like psychic and all this, but that was just like incredible. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, no, I see Michael Shermer there would immediately say and say, yeah, yeah, sure. But you're sleep deprived and it's a hallucination. Yeah, but... If, if the effects of, you see, where all of that kind of normalizing, safety, quarantining of Wu uh, falls down is is that you, the effects. So you would see effects of the wolves. If somebody actually got mauled by the wolf or something, and you say, okay, so Michael Shermer, if this is all a mental effect and it's an hallucination, how did this guy get fucking two feet in him? You know, so it, it always falls down in, in that in that safe quarantining way, always fucks up. But I, I must I must tell you one more story and then let's close it off on this story. But it's kind of like the Sri Ramakrishna story. Maybe it is a Sri Ramakrishna story, but I, 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 no, it's not a Sri Ramakrishna, but it's a Zen story, it's a common Zen story, and it's about this whole area. And, and I'll leave you with this to think about because this is kind of what I'm warning you is happening on a very big scale in, in the Pentagon. It's happening on like the highest echelons. It's happening between China and Russia. Um, and uh, it's, it's big. It's big. Um, okay. But here, if you come to your own conclusions, but, and I say there's risk in believing me on this one in a way that there isn't with the flipping. But 
um, I'll, I'll leave you with this story to try and convince you at least so you know where I'm coming from and make your own decision. But there's the sense story. Um, and I, I'll paraphrase it again. So how it goes is um, this guy, it's about manifesting shit. Right? So it, it's very like that song, you know, um, uh, in a big house. And it's, uh, how does that go? It's talking heads. Um, and it says, like, he's thinking about, you know, where did this come from? He finds himself in a big house with a family. And where did this come from? And it's, uh, he's riffing off the Zen story. So the Zen, the Zen story is about this householder, a householder in India, I guess. And he um, he's thinking, you know, he's a young guy and he's thinking, you know, I would really love a house and a family and stuff like that. And then a few years later, he's got it. He's got a house and a family and stuff. And he thinks, you know, that's really cool. I wish I had, um, but now I really wish I had like gold plates and status and stuff. And eventually he's going to, He's got that too. And, you know, he's eating off his gold plates and people are fanning him, you know, tikawalas and stuff are fanning him and stuff. And he's thinking, you know, it's really strange. Whatever I think of, it fucking comes to pass. And, and so he starts to think, you know, well, maybe I should be like uh, Raja or something. Like maybe I have a palace. And if that's true, I could think myself in a palace. And then, Sure enough, he does that, and he's very soon in a palace. And then, when he's walking around in the garden one day, thinking, you know, I do have these these powers. I can actually create a palace. I could do whatever I think comes true. And he said, "This is fucking marvelous." And then he thinks, "But hang on a minute. There's another side to this. What if I suddenly thought about a fucking bad thing like?" like a tiger jumping out of the wood and just fucking eating me. Instantly, tiger jumps out of the bush and eats me. And that, children, <laughs> I think we should end on that. But think deeply on that. And then is, is it, do you see that as the same as the what story? Or, or? Yeah, but yeah. it's also the same of creating aliens. Is yeah. you could think yourself into into a interplanetary war and wipe yourself out just like just, by thinking like a tiger. Just regarding your warning there about all this, uh, because I like to look from the point of view of what undercuts all the talk and gets right to the bottom of something. And would the best piece of equipment that a person could have be to to kind of develop their sense of discernment and discrimination so that when all this is going on that they have the the that they have this kind of fortitude if you like to to just stand back and just just don't take any action just stand right back from it and just keep looking at it you know and and ask themselves uh about this what's going on you know are they really going to get sucked into this is it real can you see what I mean? To, to be able to maintain a, a, this an arm's length. This is, what, this is yeah. what I'm doing to you now. You see, this is what yeah. I'm doing to you. In this, in this like three hours or on this video, anybody that sees this video is is starting to be inoculated against the insanity. Yeah. You see, um, you might anybody, want to do that a bit. That looks, I'm, I'm just saying, you might... This, they might say, like, okay. Hugh is fucking barking mad. You should stop listening to him. He's telling people all sorts of shit. But l listen to what I'm, I'm saying and think about it and saying, like, am I not telling you the logical thing that, that, that you know, if you, if you sat down and thought of it, about it, wouldn't you really come to the conclusion <laughs> that no matter how fucking mad Hugh is, it's like you would actually want it to be that way. You see, Ultimately, what I'm I'm telling you the tools for survival. You see, you, you part of the thing about the tiger jumping out of the jungle uh, when just because you think about it is you could say it it is also you could read it this way that it's okay that the tiger jumps out. You see, in the kind of English patient way, 
so the English patient movie, if you never saw that movie, it's like this, uh, you know, the, the here, the main protagonist and that goes through, gets badly burnt, goes through this huge struggle um, with the nurse is kind of in parallel. She's, she's kind of like Carly running through the, the mother goddess, right? So think of the mother goddess who she like gives you birth. She's your lover. She, you know, protector, your companion. And then at the end of the movie, it's all too much of a struggle. He, he's, he's too, he's too burnt. And he's going to, he's, he's, his life is wrecked. And what he does is he shoves all, all this morphine. So she gives him morphine, the nurse gives him morphine and does a pain. And basically the, the, the consort role of Carly. When he's, she's not going to kill him, put him out of his mis misery, like the, say, the one flew over the cuckoo's nest. There they have the Indian guy's mother, uh, Jack Nicholson character. Uh, that, Carly doesn't really do that. You have to give Carly the nod. Um, so, so as in the English patient movie, he he he's too he can't even speak. I don't think, but he he tells the nurse that he's ready to go, and he shoves all these ampules of morphine in her direction. In other words, say, "Give me an overdose. I'm ready to go," which she does, and that's and then she leaves, and that's how the movie ends. Now, if you take the the tiger jumping out of the the jungle, you you can take the what I'd call the Kool-Aid approach, the King's North, the religious approach, you're saying that it's all okay. When when you're ready, look, you've had a lovely life. You've had this life all the way building up to a castle and stuff. And when you're ready, then you also have the comfort of knowing that it'll be quick and you'll be taken out. See, I'm not, I'm telling you not to go there. You see, what I'm telling you is uh, is life. And so the extinction only is about survival and avoiding the tiger coming out. So this, on a personal level, I want you to survive. And on a species level, I want people to survive. So, so I'm, you know, the angel of continuity or whatever. I'm, the, I'm telling you things that will help you live. Everybody will tell you mostly ways to die. So they, they mostly everybody's a Kool-Aid salesman. And and I'm trying to tell you that the 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 story of the ages is the Christ story, and then we all do Kool-Aid in the jungle. And I'm saying like occasionally, and in this case maybe on you know a large scale, we, we could break out of that. You know, we could break out of that cycle so that we don't all you know take the Kool-Aid and do the normal play. So it's a a break in the script if we <clears throat> we don't do the fucking follow Elon Musk or Kings North to the Kool Aid. Um, but, yeah, but well, these are the, the techniques you're going to need to do to get the you know and negotiate this the psychology. So we so we you see you, what we get after the flipping if you survive it. Heaven heaven knows it's looking dodgy now, but. Um, you know, then you get a new chapter. You get a new Earth. <clears throat> it's you know the other side of Noah. But go ahead, Dibby. Yeah, I was saying that. I was going to say that what you're saying reminds me of that Ragnarok prophecy with Odin. You know, the Oracle comes up and tells him, you know, you're going to die by Frenir. The wolf is going to eat you. If Odin had not got obsessed with that thought and fucked with that wolf, Ragnarok would have never happened. <laughs> he could have said. Yeah, maybe, but I'm going to go home to my wife and kids. And you know what? Nothing would have happened. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the same as Macbeth. You see, this is the, the hidden meaning in Macbeth. See, Macbeth also does all of this, becomes becomes his own worst enemy and <clears throat> becomes his, you know, his own nemesis. So, you know, this is, all of these things are very, very old. All I'm telling you is the story of nemesis. So the ancient Greeks have warned us and stuff, but you see, the only reason why we're still alive today is because a very few people <clears throat> understood these like ancient Greek stories and the myths. So as long as a few people know and understand them and can relate them to others like I'm doing now, the yeah, danger is these, these fools, the Michael Shermans, these dead people, they're zombies, Kings North, they, they, they're walking dead. 
See, some people said, well, I understand what you meant about Kings North, but you don't, you know, I thought you were a bit harsh with him. He said, no, you don't understand. This is a demon from hell, right? This guy's possessed by a demon. You, you can't see it. You just think he's a nice guy. <laughs> that makes the demon. It's like, if, if you knew what I knew, a character like that, you you know, basically, if you thought I treated them harshly, well, you know, those guys need fucking torching with a flamethrower. You know, that would that would be appropriate. Then I was really, <laughs> I was really kind. But you, you, you see, I mean, the reason is these guys are Kool Aid merchants, right? And they they don't know it. They don't know the demon that they've got inside them. But go ahead. Yeah, it's one of the uh, reasons I linked that Derek Jensen video with the machine where he talked about how the Catholics were all kill them all and let God sort them out. It's that same demon. You know, if everyone ain't converting to, oh, the, the burden of Christianity or whatever he was saying in that crazy, you know, letter about that shit. Yeah, actually, that's happened many times uh, in the Catholic. So it wasn't only just with the Holocaust. The, the, they did that during the Crusades, too. Well, the justification of the Crusaders, these guys are Crusaders, right? So uh, the justification of the Crusaders was, was like the moral thing is like, are we, you know, it says in the Bible, don't, do not kill and stuff. Is like, uh, as soldiers of Christ, are we really doing the right thing, chopping all these Arabs' heads off? And the thing was, you know, basically, yeah, you can kill them uh, because, you know, we're doing God's will and, and God will sort out the wheat from the chaff uh, in Ammon. But you see, you know, okay, well, it's kind of uh, psychopathic, but, uh, you know, it's, it's logic. But but run through the logic, everybody dies. You see, right? you see, they're just killing some, and then the Crusaders live on, is implied, the hidden assumption, unexamined assumption in, in that. But imagine that the Crusaders are suicide bombers, and or like the Mormons, who, who have infiltrated the nuclear establishment. And want everybody gone. They want this place to be a glass ball, so that basically, you know, the angels can finish it off with Windex and polish it up, and God will sort it all out. You see, now, now there's contrary to what I'm saying is like that's not survival. So that's, but uh, yeah, you can see the danger we're in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's. Uh... Yeah, I can't even describe the evil. There's no words for it. It's just evil. Yeah. So, so yeah. If you're still not getting what I'm saying, it still sounds harsh. What I'm saying about people like Kings Orton and stuff. It's like think, think of them like suicide bombers. They're suicide bombers that want to take all of humanity out. I mean, you can say, "Oh, that's melodramatic," and I say, "No, that's the that's the psychology." And you take that psychology to its logical conclusion. It's it's. Um, misanthropic it's uh, it's you, you put all the things together you just have to amplify them a bit and you'll see it and you're like, oh fuck. now i see what you mean <laughs> it's like yeah anyway. yeah they're they're attached to that ideological or idealized image that they have of humanity and it's like you know, you got to get down in the dirt. We're animals just like all the other animals on this planet. You know, we just have the ability to self-reflect at an astonishingly, insanely sophisticated degree. But we're still animals. So if you can't, if you can't get comfortable with that dirty animal side, then, you know, there's probably not much hope for that person. Yeah. You would say that's the realization is, is realizing again unite you see it's not about happy families and we all the line lays down with the lamb it's it's that you know you you recognize our divinity and our you know, ineffable ineffable godhead inside it, and also we're just fucking chimps it's just like you know can you unite those two um in in your head it doesn't mean that it's all compatible after that or no we put aside our divinity for the sake of our primate side and just accept we primates and so they say no 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 you, they, you don't look for reconciliation we'll, we'll always be divine primates you, see, you don't want the lion to lay down with the lamb that's what all these kool-aid merchants want 
Yeah, that slight tension is healthy. It's how, you know, species evolve. You know, the, it's not completely this pink cloud harmony. It is sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's life is the pain and uncertainty, <laughs> the rich pageant. That, so, you know, all of these things, were, which we will all be one world. We will all be united. We can all get together. The line will lie down. And they, they're narratives of death. They mean that, that history will end. We will all be good communists. They're all narratives of then the show ends. Fundamentally, they don't like the show. They want to stop the clock. So like, well, you can stop the clock by killing yourself, but there's a better way to stop the clock. And that's by Kairos. Is by, you, you know, if, if you're absolutely in the moment, you can stop the clock and live. Does that make any sense? Yeah, living without, you know, pre preordained goals, just, you know, uh, it's that, it's like that, that William Blake quote that I love, he who catches the sun as it flies lives in eternity sunrise or something. He who catches the joy as it flies lives in eternity sunrise. Yeah, you see, Blake knew this. this. It's very hard to communicate to and then and then everybody's distracted, they have no time. <laughs> And I guess with that, we should give everybody back their Kronos. <laughs> and round it off there. Thanks, Hugh. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, well, it would be a shame if we didn't uh, give this one up and just um, just go through the ritual. So this the meditation at the end of here, this exercise, it is a spell, and it's a spell of detachment so you don't you don't want to hang on anything i've said and stuff it's like you you know i'm, I'm i don't want to put you in a time machine so you get stuck on this because as soon as this ends this is going to be in the past so what does that say is to cut the the cord and leave it in the past and not uh, cling and hold back you see you've got to move on <laughs> the hands of time are moving on so don't cling to the past and, you know, kings north <laughs> and, and don't uh, don't get too far ahead in the future see i i will end this one more thing before we do this but there have been times in the past that i've been so so clued into that that the so that i've actually felt the the heat coming from behind. so i've often got felt very got a very strong impression you know that like you often people say well your past catching up with you and they say like yo you're feeling the heat so i've often got that literally almost that the the past is the heat and it, the the future is cold and so you can keep in this goldilocks uh, zone and you know almost so that if you if you get too ahead of yourself you start to feel the chill you get cold feet and if you start to you know move too far back then the accountants and the lawyers and the cops and all these horrible <laughs> little zombie army coming after each other, you know, then they, you start to feel the heat of that. And then you can just stay in the Skaldilocks zone, which is on the razor's edge. And that's, uh, so to put us back on the razor's edge um, and not to feel the heat <laughs> or uh, get ahead of ourselves and get too cold, uh, let's equalize the temperature and just do it by by falling still and consciously renouncing everything you heard here, detaching from it. And to detach from it, just connect to the silence. Om Paramatmane Namah Iti. Okay, everybody. Well, that was cool. So, Gary, can you end the recording? And Gary, what is that? Yeah, I'm onto it. Just give me half a second. Yep. Okay. Um, just because I haven't. Oh, yeah, here we go. Stop recording.
Oh, I think it took him off when he stopped. Re oh, did he come back? Oh, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> we might lose three, three and a half hours. <laughs> so anyway. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just have to see if it's there. Because I'm just using my phone and I really, I've never done it before. But it, it was it's showing the recording. Hit so, on the so ellipsis I, there and, and you can see yeah. stop recording. Yeah, I've done. Yeah, but I think it, it logs me out. Hang on. 